Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Izuku has a god core part 1 before I start. Please do support for more amazing content and comments for part 2. Do consider to subscribe my channel and share my video to your friends and check out the description as well. Let's start the video. Quirks. One of the many factors that will dictate how an individual will live his life. Such things are mostly outside of the control of the individual, many blanks filled in before for him or her. Though your parents and what their quirks are will likely influence you, long before you were granted consciousness or free will for many, quirks are merely part of who they are, for others, quirks are their very being. The debate would be long and boring, should we begin to dive down the rabbit hole, but for an easier time for all of us, a short version should suffice for now. Are certain quirks inheriting evil by their very nature? Or does the individual define the nature of their quirk with their actions? Deep and philosophical questions such as these normally would be left for scholars and those interested in human psyche. So, how does a four-year-old ends up reflecting over the very nature of his being? Ask the question to one Midori Izuku, currently sprawled on the ground. The preschooler was staring at the grey sky, a welcome drizzling rain lightly pouring down over his frame, much to his delight. His sensitive and burnt skin thanked the tiny blessing of the heavens for such a mercy, considering he had received none from his friend. Well, calling Bakugu Katsuki a friend was a bit of a stretch. Acquaintance would also be too good. If Izuku were to define Bakugu into one word, maybe explosive or unstable would fit better the young blonde. You might ask yourself, why is Midori on the ground of a local park in his neighborhood with Katsuki nowhere in sight? That would be, depending on who you ask, a funny story. You see, kids already have a somewhat chaotic tendency, since they are growing up and learning what is good and bad by trial and error. In a perfect society, kids would be taught by both their parents and their school, the intricacies of good and evil. A perfect society, that is. Pile up superpowers on about 80% of the population of the entire world, some government restrictions of the use of said powers to specific people and jobs, and add a dash of hero business work necessity, and you have the current world in which tiny Midoriya lives in. A world where your quirk will mostly define who you will be, a bottom feeder working a dead-end job which you hate or a high-class member of society. Akiku Kasuki's parents are an odd duo, but the currently important details here are their quirks. From his father, a simple oxidation quirk, nothing truly special, but when combined with his mother's glycerin quirk, biology ends up creating a literal explosion urchin capable of sweating nitroglycerin. In a society based around quirks and heroes, being capable of creating explosions at your convenience was considered rather top tier. As such, many would end up sucking up and overpraising said explosion urchin. Add an already great sense of self, and you get one Bakugo Kasuki. Izuku slowly rose from the damp ground, some mud sticking to his clothes. He checked his burns, all of them gone. Enough of moody thoughts, he'd better head home or else his mother might worry. The walk home was filled with dizzying smells and noises, something that tiny Izuku couldn't help. His senses were always sharper than of those around him. Many would probably praise Izuku for such abilities, but such individuals were off put by the sight of his pale skin and almost unblinking eyes, or maybe it was the sharp nails and fangs in his mouth. The tiny, green bundle reached home quickly and discarded his dirty clothes, depositing them on the bast of the bathroom before heading in for a shower. A few minutes later, Izuku was clean and eager to watch another marathon of All Might videos. They always cheered Izuku, the American-themed hero being a bastion of happiness and strength that would inspire anyone with his smile. His declarations that anyone could be a hero warmed the green-haired boy's heart. Anyone, even someone as creepy and off-putting as Izuku. The video currently playing was one which Izuku had watched countless times. Civilians being rescued, building burning in the background, the usual spiel of hero work. Izuku was deeply focused on the video, forgetting the curtains of his room open, as the rainy weather blocked the sunlight that hurt so much. Well, his weather prediction skills weren't the greatest. The previous drizzle stopped and the clouds stopped blocking the sun rays, which decided the boy hadn't had enough for the day. His exposed right arm released steam and felt as if he had dropped hot embers on it, as Izuku hissed and rushed away from the sunlight, holding his arm against his torso to nurse the somewhat burnt limb. His mother rushed inside the room, worry clearly painted all over her face. Aizu-chan. Are you okay? Inko's desperate tone was clear for the world to hear as she rushed and hugged her baby boy. He didn't say anything, too focused on the pain of the regenerating limb. A few minutes later, his arm was as good as new. Not that the phantom pangs of pain were any better. Here, Aizu-chan. Inko offered her left arm for him, but Izuku refused. If people saw the marking on his mother's arms again, they would start the mean comments again. Instead, he did the best impression of All Might's smile. It's okay, mommy. Why? Because I'm here. And Colette the worry painting her face disperse, smothering her son in another hug. Mommy is so proud of you, Aizu-chan. Izuku felt happiness flood his heart. It was okay, he could feed later. There were some blood packs on the fridge, and even if they tasted bland, they would be enough. He freed himself from his mother's embrace, and carefully made his way back to the computer, dragging the chair away from the sunlight. 
His mother stood up and closed the curtains and kissed him on the forehead, going back to making dinner. As the woman left his room, Izuku returned to his video. He couldn't wait for his opportunity to become a hero. Medical Files Patient, 0569101 Midori Izuku Gender Male Age 04 years Quirk Hemomins or Vampirism the following individual presents a mutation gene that does not precede any of his progenitors, but is a result of a mutation on his quirk gene. Observed effects are as following. Extreme regeneration capabilities, enhanced senses and limited blood manipulation have all been noticed by staff during the quirk examination process. More abilities might be present, but have not been presented or discovered. The child has been cleared for special feeding as per doctor orders, and will receive blood packs to supplement the inherent thirst for blood that was also reported by the patient. A few counterpoints have been identified during the triage such as Sensitivity to sunlight, bloodlust and sadistic tendencies have all been noticed and are likely a result of the natural biology of the individual's quirk, pushing for an ambush-styled feeding cycle focused on nocturnal activities. The patient's psyche is surprisingly stable for one with such an aggressive quirk, as tests have been performed to classify any dangerous behavior that might follow from the patient. Results identified the patient as stable and in control of his behavior, but further testing is required as hormone levels have yet to spike. The years passed by Izuku rather quickly. He took the time to indulge in his hobbies, considering he had no friends to spend time with. School had become an acceptable place. His classmates mostly left him alone to his musings, only talking with him when necessary, which suited the pale teen rather okay. His weakness due to sunlight was, ironically, becoming weaker and weaker as the days passed and he toasted under the terrible light of the sun. Nighttime had become something Izuku dearly wished for every day. It was when he was at his strongest, a time where his skin wasn't practically boiling, and when Yusutafu became a personal paradise for him. Skulking around in the night, long after his mother was asleep, had become a habitual affair for him. Today was an average day for the vampire, the nickname had been gifted to him, after some students saw him drinking from a blood bag after a particularly stressful day. To be honest, it was Bakugou who had gifted him the nickname. Izuku simply let it fly by, getting upset by it would become grounds for more pranks and jokes from the blonde and his goons. The teacher droned on about the professional career choices, and how everyone wanted to become a hero. Izuku stayed quiet, focused on his book. The Hemimans are found easier to let others drive the mood of the class, this way he could focus on his own quirk analyses. It was a habit of his, analyzing quirks, especially his own. His visits to the hospital had become non-mandatory after he became 10, the doctor stating that if he hadn't had a case up to now, control over his instincts would be a normal affair for the green-haired teen. The thirst for blood was always there, some days weaker, some days stronger, he always made do with the blood packs the hospital provided. As the teacher tried to pacify a rather smug Bakugou, the blonde going on an ego trip after the teacher mentioned his mock tests for Yue, the man let slip a tiny bit of information. Midoriya has also wrote Yue was gunning for Yue, he wrote it in his application sheet. The teacher whispered loudly, making the blonde boy freeze in his tracks. Izuku regretted writing that on his paper. He prepared to the blonde's predictable outburst, which came soon after as a hand slapped over his desk, causing an explosion over the wooden structure. A cacophony of laughter followed the other students. Oh I, you fucking prick. What's the meaning of this? I'm the only one worthy of going to UA from this shitty dump. Many whines and whispers left the student body of the classroom. Many hated the way Bakugou behaved, but couldn't go against the blonde. Bakugou was considered the top from the class and the whole school. The teacher, seeing his mistake, glanced at the clock, hoping to not get involved with the teens. He felt bad for Izuku, but what could he do? Izuku, on his part, waited for Bakugou to finish his ravenous rant against his peers in absolute silence. He was used to this sing a song. Let the blonde burn out and run out of steam, then evade and flee. As the blonde busied himself with talking down his classmates, Izuku quietly packed his things, hoping the school bell would ring just a tad earlier. His wishes were, surprisingly, granted. As the bell rang and signaled the end of school hours, the pale boy quickly left his table, startling the close by students, and inciting the anger of the blonde boy. Izuku usually wasn't the speedy type, so seeing him almost blink from his place to the classroom door was a surprise for all those in. Izuku took the chance and increased his pace, avoiding the blonde with vigor and leaving school grounds. Many found just about everything Izuku did creepy. The way he walked, always searching for a shaded spot, his skin tone or his sharp nails. The green-haired youth had learned to ignore the murmurs and nicknames. His quick pace took the teen to a rather shady part of town. The teen sighed. This kind of thing was rather common, where he'd lose himself in his thoughts and let his feet guide him to somewhere random. While such happening was usual for the Hemimincer vampire, the sharp smell of blood in the air was something else. Botham. His heart quickened its pace and his nostrils sucked in a hefty amount of air, base instincts flaring up at such sweet and delicious smell. Fresh blood. Nothing like the packed crap he was accustomed to drink to sedate the thirst. 
the teen white in his eyes. Something was not right here. He rushed into the next alley, avoiding the occasional ray of light. The streets were not empty, but certainly lacked in people. His body seemed to awaken, shivers running down his spine as the smell of blood thickened, his nose trying to find the source of the bleeding. Sniff sniff. I found you. The thought popped with unexpected excitement in his mind. He unconsciously licked his lips, finding his throat much too dry. More alleys and less light, such pattern repeated three times before he found the source of the smell which was driving him crazy. Stalking into the shadows, Izuku found a duo, a girl and a man. The man was laid down belly first on the ground, his upper back being repeatedly stabbed by the girl, who was mounted over his lower back. Blonde hair tied into two messy buns and school uniform, she was not someone you would expect to be stabbing a man in an alley. Izuku could not catch her face, but one whiff of the air was enough for him to know that none of the blood that was splattered on the ground was hers. No signs of struggle or battle. She was quick to stab him in mostly non-vital areas, keeping him alive for a bigger amount of time. Come on, let me see more. Your blood has such a pretty color, huh? Don't you think so? Her voice was sickly sweet, almost as if the situation was girls talk or something one shared with their best friend. The man seems to have already gone into shock. He analyzed the scene, his heart thumping wildly against his chest, as his own blood begged for action. Izuku's mind was screaming for him to move already and help the man in need, yet his body refused the notion, and focused on how the blood seemed more and more attractive. A quick slash to his own wrist, and the teen had his life liquid running like a fountain down his arm. The girl dressed in the sailor uniform twitched, her head slowly turning back in search of a new source. Her instincts blared, and with agility, she jumped away from the man, a wet noise emanating as her knife left his flesh. There was a whirling noise close to her ear, something red having cut closer than what she would have liked. She shifted to find her new aggressor, mind running high to find an escape route. Himiko was not made for surprise confrontations, unless she had been the one to set the ambush. She found someone, or something. It was hard to describe the figure hidden in the shadows, the only indicator that something had tried to attack her was the crimson colored rod that was visible and the red glowing eyes. The smell made her blush. Blood. New blood. And someone with a super interesting court to boot. She would love to meet this new person who found her, if they weren't so aggressive, maybe they could be best friends. Ichiwaya Himiko waved her hand in a cheerful manner, her knife held in a cute way to avoid suspicion. How could she make new friends if the person was suspicious of her? She put her best smile on her face. How would you like to be friends? I'm not scary, come out of the shadow. Let's be besties. She displayed her excitement with vigor. A new friend would be someone who she could become. Just like Stainy. The person in the shadows didn't comply with her. They slashed at their own wrist with something, and then the person made as if to throw something at her, but all that happened was life liquid splattering against her uniform. M-O-H-H I was trying to not dirty this one. You need to say your name first. Just showing your blood is new Himiko wanted to say something else, but she once more found her instincts blaring to life to alert her of danger. She could not see any danger, and when she noticed the wriggling on her clothes, she was already bound by something. Himiko fell face first into the dirty floor of the alley, the figure hidden in the shadow finally exiting the man walking her way. Himiko tried to wiggle and struggle out of these sudden bindings, but when they moved to wrap her wrists, the blonde realized why the sudden addition to her date had splattered blood over her. The smile on her lips grew. How cool. Being able to control his own blood like that must be so nice. Izuku, after confirming that the aggressor was firmly bound, walked to check on the victim of her assault. Multiple stab wounds made blood flow freely from the man's back and soaked his shirt, staining it in a rather beautiful color. That, or Izuku's hunger was talking louder. His nostrils flared to suck in more of the nice aroma, but the teen tightened his fist, an effort to control himself. He picked his phone and dialed for an ambulance. After giving his current location to the hospital, Izuku pocketed high phone and turned to look at the bound girl, only to find that he was staring at himself. What the hell? A scare was enough that Izuku deactivated his power, the hemimency making the anticoagulants and the blood bindings stop working, and making it return to his former liquid normalcy. That was all that was necessary for his full close to quickly get up and flee from his presence. As the figure ran away, sludge began to fall off and drip from the person, revealing to be the same blonde girl. She smiled and showed him a V with her hands. Bye bye cutie. Let's meet again SOO and Nimbler and faster that Izuku could process her actions, the girl was gone. Deciding that the best course of actions would be to protect the unconscious victim, Izuku lifted the man from the ground carefully and propped him against a close by wall as he waited for the ambulance. Ten minutes later, he heard the distinct sirens of both the ambulance and from police cars. The teen sighed, already picturing himself being interrogated. Izuku could only complain inside his mind as the cops appeared first. Put your hands up. He obeyed the others, lest he be shot. It had happened once and it was not fun. I apologize for the rudeness of my subordinates, Midoriya-kun. A man dressed in a trench coat and fedora apologized to the teen, bowing his head slightly at the vampire. 
I don't mind, Tsukechi-san. It must have been rather suspicious, me being so close to the scene and my appearance. Izuku tried to make the man raise his head. The teen had already gotten accustomed to people being afraid or suspicious of his looks, so it was nothing new for him. Steaming under sunlight and being able to control your own blood usually did that to people. The detective was someone whom Izuku had some familiarity, seeing as he had been interrogated by the man quite a few times. Being out late in the night and having red eyes, Izuku had all the markings of a serial killer. If you were to stumble on him during one of his relaxing night walks, due to that, the teen had had the police being called on him in a few too many occasions. All of which involved the detective. Once Izuku had asked the trench coat wearing man and his answer made the teen's eyes glimmer with joy. Tsukechi sensed cork was light detection, which made him rather suited for police work. After the usual round of questions, Izuku had hounded the detective about even a little detail of his quirk. While Tsukechi couldn't reveal to him the inner workings of his quirk to a random 15-year-older, he had given the boy a few tips in what to watch out for if people were lying. Coupled with Izuku's sharp senses, the tips had been useful for the young Hemimincer in discerning those whom were disgusted by the sight of his person, and subtler physical cues allowed Izuku to read people rather accurately. Anyway, Midoriya-kun, we cleared you of any suspicion, you are free to go. Please, do try to avoid situations like these, there's only so much trouble in one town," Tsukechi said. Izuku nodded to his words and proceeded to once more make his way back home. As Izuku made his way back home, he opted to take a shaded path, avoiding the sun's rays as best as possible. Due to his random walking earlier, he had to take a longer path to go home. When Izuku found a bridge, he made a beeline for it, his steam exiting his body as he still got caught by some light. Protecting himself under the bridge, Izuku took the time for a breather, feeling the steam that exited his body slowly stop. A few spots on his skin were rather raw, but they soon recovered their pale tone as his regeneration kicked in. One of the abilities Izuku had been forcing his body to develop was what he liked to call Daywalker. While the title sounded fancy, it was merely a continuous use of his regenerative abilities to force his body to adapt to his worst weakness, sunlight. The results had been going favorably for the teen, as nowadays he merely steamed. In his younger days, Izuku would almost boil alive under the might of his enemy. Tilting his head sideways, emitting a satisfying pop from his neck, Izuku took a deep breath and was about to continue his walk home when his senses screamed in alert as his nose picked on the smell of something fell. His body seemed to flicker in place, so fast was the back step that Izuku did. The distance allowed him to avoid the musky green sludge that emerged from a manhole cover, red eyes and disgustingly yellow teeth, forming the face of his new attacker. It was quite apparent that Izuku had the luck of the devil, seeing as this was his second villain for the day. Yes, villain. The sludge man's eyes passed a clear message for the Hemimincer, a villain fleeing and finding a convenient victim. A fleshy disguise and a rather top-notch one. Plain looking and all. A wave of nausea hit Izuku as the villain's breath hit his face, the teen already slashing at his own wrist with his nails. And would you look at that. Giving me an easy entry. How kind. This will only hurt very much. The intimidation fell flat for Izuku, who was more bothered with the man's foul breathe than his looks. The villain lunged towards the teen, sludge coming akin to a wave. Izuku flicked his wrist, the blood dripping from his arm coming alive in the shape of a collapsible baton. His body looks entirely like sludge, but the only parts that solidified are his eyes and teeth. If my guess is right then. THWAK. Argue shitty brat. The teen had whacked his baton on the villain's eyes, making the man flinch and roar in pain as he backed off. Izuku's red eyes glimmered, his sharp fangs being exposed as this time, Izuku himself lunged to attack the villain. Lean muscles swung the iron hard rod of blood with strength, his target this time were the yellow and misshapen teeth of his would-be aggressor. There was a cracking sound, the villain gurgling as a few of his teeth broke under the might of the impact, as he backed further away from the green and pale-skinned Izuku. The vampire did not let up and followed through with another swing, this time his baton assumed the shape of a blade. The sword looked like cut off a mean-sized chunk of sludge, but this did not seem to have any effect on the villain, as the goose splattered uselessly on the asphalt. Izuku proceeded to continue shaving off bits of the sludge man, his crimson sword not meeting any resistance as it carved away at the villain. All the while, Izuku's blood-red eyes shone with unearthly light, and his lips settled onto a mix between a grin and a sneer. The sludge villain could not answer to the vicious assault, as every time he tried to counter-attack, the teen would aim for his sensitive spots. The attacks were quick and packed a mean punch. Yet, he would not be defeated here. Not by a shitty brat. The IOU. The sludge villain gathered his resolve and made for an all-out attack. Expanding all the remaining sludge that hadn't been sliced off his body, Izuku picked up on the intentions of the villain before the man had committed to his assault. He coldly used his left hand, the sharp nails digging into the flesh of his right wrist with a sickening sound, and drew out his now wet fingers. Before the blood could obey gravity, it quickly followed the intent of the teen, and formed a crimson gauntlet over his right arm, his fingers covered in vermilion that shone like steel under sunlight. 
His mind told him that he would probably blind the villain, but his instincts were roaring for him to finish the man who dared stand against him. His normally neat behavior was flipped on its head as first instance of real combat triggered something inside Izuku. He had never gone out of his way to see conflict and did all he could to avoid it, but now it was as if provoking a slumbering beast that should have never been awoken. Had Izuku never been attacked by this villain, he would probably never trigger his bloodlust. Maybe it was the due to the fact that today he had his first whiff of fresh human blood. Whatever it was, he didn't care right now. All that mattered was that he was going to prove his might against this enemy. A predator. A true predator. A true ancestor. Everything will be okay. Why, you ask. A booming voice echoed under the bridge, the manhole cover being blown away as a figure emerged from it. Because I'm here. There is only person who speaks like that. There is no way. All. Oh. Before Izuku's line of thought could complete itself, he felt a big hand grab a hold of his right wrist, and then air pressure dispersed his bloody weaponry, together with also dispatching the sludge villain, by simply splattering the man against the nearby wall, with absurd levels of strength. The air current almost made Izuku lose consciousness, so strong was the power of the gust created by the pinnacle of hero society. The symbol of peace, all might. Hello there, young man. I must apologize for getting you caught up in my business, but this city has quite a complex solar system. Ha 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 ha. The hero laughed comically. The rippling mass of muscle that was All Might moved with dizzying speed, scooping up the villain inside two soda bottles. Izuku's senses were sharper than most people, but he could barely follow the hero's shadow, much less his form as he did his hero work. It seems that you are All Might, so I'll take the chance to leave. Please be careful out there, young man. As fast as he appeared, All Might seemed to be ready to leave. Izuku felt a million things going at miles per hour inside his head, and he tried to ask the hero for one thing, anything out be good. All Might. See you, shonen, young teen. With that, the hero was out of sight. Izuku could only stare at the trails as the top hero of Japan flew far from his sight. Sighing in defeat, Izuku once more began making his way back to his home. After he returned home, the teen went to his room without much thought to anything else. He let his backpack on the bed and went to sit on the chair of his desk. Izuku searched in his drawers for a notebook. He found a book, Self Analyses and Developments, and opened it on the last page he had worked on. Noted down were the current abilities Izuku had gotten so far, together with some medical comments. The green-haired youth got a pen and began to write down the developments of the day. Hunter senses, hemomancy or blood weaving, high-speed regeneration, these were the most basic abilities that he had. The others he had developed were daywalker, blood sense and blood cleanse. His fight against the sludge villain had shown him that his quirk was still developing, and had much more room to grow. He never had felt such primal rage and anger up to now, but today had been a trial. Izuku had resisted. He hoped to be able to continue resisting the urges, but it seemed that to further develop his abilities, some of his morals would need to become flexible. Bloodlust, as he named the state, had granted Izuku access to further advanced hemomancy, which in turn allowed him to create the dangerous gauntlet from earlier. There was also that blonde girl. Izuku decided to rest earlier today. There was much that needed to be done, the UA exams were fast approaching, and the vampire hemomancer had work that needed to be done. One of the best aspects of his quirk was the energy that came with it, as the night swallowed the daylight. Izuku loved the rush of power that came to him in the deep of the night, when most of the city was asleep. Jumping from rooftop to rooftop, the Hemomancer was out for one of his usual strolls, enjoying the thrill of it. The habit had been one that he picked up to burn the excess of energy that came when the sun went down, and it had improved his physical aspects. His frame still appeared lean and thin, but under his clothes were compact muscles that allowed him to easily move like a phantom in the night. Besides, nighttime was when some of the most dangerous villains were out to commit their evil deeds, but also was the time when the lesser known yet equally important heroes went about to reduce the criminal activity. Hidden it out of sight, Izuku could appreciate real-time hero fieldwork. His notes in self-based combat had been filled to the brim, courtesy of pro hero Racerhead. He had also noted down the practical cat combat that had been developed by the group Wild Pussycats. This time the green-haired teen was in search of the poorly dressed man, Eraserhead, hoping to see him in action once more. Today had been rather quiet, meaning that Izuku had a notebook rather empty. The vampire hemomancer sighed and left his perch atop an AC unit, the angle of it allowing him to hide rather well when he leaned against it. Deciding to settle in for the day, the teen took his time to stretch and work out the kinks from being in a single position for such a long amount of time. Searching his backpack for a quick drink, Izuku grabbed the mostly cooled off blood bag inside his pack and sank his fangs into it, quickly draining the plastic of its contents. Letting out a pleased noise after gulping down the somewhat bland tasting blood, Izuku wiped the corner of his mouth his hand. Guessing something isn't going to happen today after all. I was hopping even for a purse snatcher, but well. Izuku said to himself, glancing at the screen of his phone and checking the time. Seeing as he still had quite some time before dawn, the vampire decided to work with his quirk. 
Normally, training his cork was hard, seeing as he had to bleed to have access to his most useful tool. It was quite understandable that there were no places that were willing to let Izuku use their facilities. As such, the Hemimenser mostly experimented in the deep nights, far from his home. He would definitively give his mother a heart attack if she were to see him cutting himself to have access to his blood. Chuckling to himself at the thought, Izuku quickly sliced at his wrist with the aid of his sharp claws. Closing his eyes to better his focus, Izuku tapped into his power. The slow flow of blood from his wrist quickly obeyed his command, settling over the cut wrist, and covering the entirety of his arm up to his elbows in richly colored crimson. Advanced hemimancy was quite complicated, as the vampire had to focus in the image of his armament, control the flow of blood and micromanage the amount of blood he had outside of his body. As much cool as it was to be able to use his blood however he wanted, there was also the fact that he was using his own life force to display battle prowess. If he were to pull too much out of his body at once, he could lose control of the life liquid and go into shock. If only that were the only problem, the teen would not complain too much. Izuku knew of his thirst for fresh blood, and he theorized that should he ever lose control of himself, hunter senses would trigger. Izuku had no idea what would happen if he were to let such thing happen, so he put a leash on himself constantly. Every day, the thirst was there, whispering into his ears about how he could satiate himself fully if he were to simply give in. The people in Alderet Jr. would never know someone was under his control, they could never phantom the idea. Izuku knew that if delighted himself in fresh blood, he developed more his quirk, his instincts begged for him to nab even one single person. Yet Izuku held himself back for the sake of others. If he drank from one, he knew he would not be satisfied with a single drink or a single vessel. Realizing he was going in a rather dark chain of thoughts, the teen sighed deeply. He craned his neck sideways, low cracking sounds emitting from his neck, as he did a calming exercise. He returned his focus to his training, the Hemimenser began shifting the shape of the blood gauntlet covering one of his arms. Adding claws and spikes, adding bulk to the bloody construct as to increase its defensive capabilities and so forth. After 40 minutes of advanced hemimancy, Izuku stopped for a breather. Letting the blood flow back into his body by once more slashing at his wrist, the green-haired vampire began doing inverted push-ups, managing to keep his body perfectly straight with his legs up in the air. Gravity did its best to thwart his efforts, but the countless hours doing the exercise paid up. Exercising was one of the best ways for him to keep his mind from going into dark spirals of its own. There was also the fact that he could never be sore due to lactic acid buildup, considering the fact that even if he broke down his muscle fibers intensely, his high-speed regeneration ensured that he never suffered the after-effects of intense workout. It was one of the perks his quirk offered him in exchange for his weakness to sunlight. One he forced himself to overcome through literal blood and tears. Once Izuku finished his push-ups, he wiped the layer of sweat over his body with a towel, and after checking the time, the screen of his phone accusing just shy of 5 o'clock am, the young teen decided to head back home. He flash stepped all the way, using the opportunity to also train his speed and eye coordination. Since it was so early in the morning, there would be few to none heroes patrolling the streets, which gave the teen the opportunity to test how well he could move in a city environment. After a 20 minute high speed ran to reach his home, Izuku took his time cooling down. He sat on a stool as the living room's TV droned about the usual spiel, the teen going over some notes about his workout. He left the televisor on, and went with his morning routine of washing up. After he returned to the living room, his mother already up and running the kitchen. Izuku bittered the usual morning pleasantries and headed to his section of the kitchen, where a small fridge was beside the normal refrigerator. He opened it and took a blood bag, immediately sinking his fangs into it, and draining the bag of the iron-rich content. Letting out a muffled noise of contentment, the vampire discarded the plastic and sat close to his mother, as she laid his portion of breakfast, scrambled eggs and cutely shaped ectopy sausages. A mug of coffee was also close by, the drink something that always suited the teen's tastes. Izuku would always appreciate the fact that his mother would wake up so early in the morning to spend some time with him. The practice had done her wonders, as the woman was losing the slight gut she had accumulated over Izuku's younger days. Stress eating tendencies. Being the single mother of an aberration like him could be stressful, yet she shouldered the burden and never complained. The vampire would make sure that she'd never have to worry about him anymore. Financially, their situation was not bad. Although Inko worked in an accounting firm, the majority of their household income came from the financial investments that the green-haired Hemimincer had done. Give a kid enough time, some pocket money and subtract friends from the equation, and you would be surprised about the outcome. After their breakfast, the duo split up to get ready for their routines. As Izuku entered his room once again, he barely gave attention to his habitation as he put on his school uniform. Although his room is fairly spartan, there were clear signs of his usage of the room. The limited edition Almite poster, a rather expensive computer laid on a simple desk, surrounded by a diversity of notebooks and various other books. His own smartphone and the headphones that were atop his black bed. 
These details, however, could only be noticed if one were to fully open the door, spread the curtains open and turn the lights on. The teen moved in the darkness of the room with no hesitation, doing what he came to do and leaving just as quick. Skull, as always, went by like usual. The students ignored him, Katsuki went about being his brash and arrogant self, and Izuku ghosted by. The vampire had to admit that there was a certain spark to the ash blonde's confidence. Yeah, he was beyond prideful and so sure of himself, but Bakugou could back his boastful claims. Among the teens of Aldera Jr., no one could claim to have a better quirk. Well, almost no one. Izuku was pretty sure his quirk could match Katsuki's and dish out as much as the bomber. Besides, there were many limitations to the blonde's nitroglycerin sweat, many of which Izuku could bypass rather easily. Bakugou could only sweat so much before he dehydrated. His body could only handle so much knockback from his explosions. His temper was as explosive as his quirk, which meant he could easily be exploited by simple provocations. Bakugou was a force of nature for sure, and would no doubt become a powerful hero. However, there was only so much one could accomplish with only power. Snapping out of his customary mental exercise dissection, Izuku quickly packed his belongings, eagerly waiting for the skull bell to ring. As it did, Izuku moved. His flash step was something that his classmates were still not used to, but they understood why the green-haired vampire would vanish as quickly as possible. Not that they liked though, considering that now they had to deal with the suddenly ravenous, self-proclaimed, solely worthy student Bakugou and his angry shouts. After he left the school grounds, Izuku took his time walking to the center of Musatafu, this time under the dim sunlight of the afternoon. Izuku had already requested of his mother a night to spend away in another district. Apparently, a racer had has been sighted in the neighborhood district, where there had been recent cases of heroes being hunted down and being injured in overly brutal states. Izuku hoped he would get to see the pro hero in action once more. Of course his mother would never allow him to sleep over in another district if she knew of his plans. Hence the reason why he told her that he was going to Kihabara for a meet and greet for the recently debuted Mount Lady. The event there truly was going to happen, so Izuku had a solid alibi. He would later decide if having no friends was a benefit, considering that there would be no one who would rat him out, or if having them would have been better, as a friend could tell the worried mother that he was spending the night over. With her reluctant approval, Izuku needed only to rent a cheap room in the vicinities of the Chiyoda Ward of Tokyo, and pay the for the place. It did not matter if he was never physically present in the place, so long as he did pay the deposit fee, which he had done already. All the preparations had been completed, so Izuku needed only to wait until the dead of the night to be on the prowl. His heart began pumping vigorously at the mere thought of seeing a racer head in action, or maybe catching a fight between a hero and a villain. The young Hemimincer decided to spend the afternoon and wait for the evening in a local coffee house. So excited in his endeavors, Izuku never noticed that the shop he entered was a cat cafe type of shop. Barely two steps in the store, the vampire felt every pair of feline eyes focus directly upon his frame. He was almost successful in escaping the place, however, two employees had cut off his escape route. The young women were dressed in maid outfits that were clearly emphasizing their more womanly attributes, and the women knew this. The excuse me. Izuku's attempt at fleeing was thwarted, the ladies grabbing his arms in gentle embraces, and their faces held kind smiles. The teen shivered as even his unusual appearance was not capable of stopping the two maids. Truly, the power of money was unstoppable. The duo of women brought him to a table and sat him on the surprisingly comfortable chair. Once he was on his chair, the black-haired beauty of the duo brought him a menu, and silently settled it in front of him. Hello, dear customer. Welcome to Nekapar, our wonderful cafe. If there is anything you need, just say the word and we will promptly help you. The brunette spoke with confidence and posture. Izuku tried to explain to her that the animals in the place would most likely not like his presence here. Animals knew by instinct other animals, and invading the territory of another animal, men challenged their authority. Izuku did not want to flare his instincts over the cats in the shop, but the gleaming eyes of the felines were telltale signs that they did not like his presence here. In the end, Izuku merely nodded to the attendant, eyes quickly skimming over the options of the rather cute menu. I'll have black coffee and some cake, please. He meekly asked. The other waitress, a stunning blonde, excitedly clasped her hands and ran back to the kitchen, while the black-haired beauty went to check on other customers. The vampire sighed in defeat. He took his phone for any news or rumors about Eraserhead, but he knew it was much too soon for the pro hero to be out and about. As such, Izuku merely glanced at the feed of his social media, not truly paying attention to any specific news. Soon, his order arrived by the hands of the blonde girl. Now that he paid more attention to her features, he saw that there were two small and furly ears atop her head. The appendages twitched softly, and Izuku found himself weirdly affixed by the sight. Here is your order, dear customer. Is there anything else that you might need? The blonde asked, but she caught his starring. A rather devious smile settled on her lips as she began moving about with a previously unseen allure. Dear CSTOMER please, if there is any other thing I can do for you, you need only say the word, Naya Izuku felt a shiver run down his spine. 
he gulped as the girl fixed a lock of hair in place. Before he could say anything else, the girl backed away from him with a truly cat-like smile. Izuku blushed at the teasing, conscious that she was playing with him. As she ran off to do her job, Izuku was mostly left alone. Time passed by at a slow rate, the hemimins are idling about the cafe, once in a while ordering a refill for his mug of coffee. The flow of customers varied, as did the waitresses. It was a nice treat for the teen, seeing the many different cat girls that worked in the shop. It was only after his second hour in the shop that he noticed that all the waitresses here were girls with a variation on cat quirk, an apparent specialty of the place. The niche seemed to be successful, a rather tasteful combination of cute cat girls, made outfits, cats and good food. On his tent mug of coffee, Izuku decided to play a game to help pass time. As he looked around the shop, he tried to guess the quirks of the individuals and their effects. Some were easier than others, the waitresses had their various cat quirks, with both the benefits and downsides. There was a guy that had wings on his back, evidently a bird type of quirk, mostly likely a falcon due to the shape of the feathers. Another guy was mostly normal, although his hair was dyed red, but Izuku could see sharp and jagged teeth in his mouth. There was a blonde girl with an impressive set of horns. She seemed rather excited to be in the shop, her blue eyes sparkling at the uniforms of the waitresses. Just as Izuku was about to continue his game, he heard footsteps coming his way. The vampire mostly ignored it in favor of trying to guess another quirk, but he felt the presence of someone settled by his side. Which right after, a hand settled on his right shoulder. Izuku turned his head to look at the person, surprising himself as he saw a zombie in front of him. No, wait. There was no zombie, but a person. A sleep-deprived looking person, but a person nonetheless. Lavender eyes and hair, the teen in front of the vampire, gave a rather standoffish vibe. He certainly did not seem to be here to start a friendship with Izuku. See could I help you with something? Izuku hesitantly asked the other teen. The boy looked at him with a serious expression as the hand on Izuku's shoulder tightened slightly. Yeah, buddy. How about you be a creep in another place? Quit with your disgusting starring at the girls. The words hit Izuku like a bullet. He was not expecting such a wild response. Had he gave off the wrong vibe, or maybe the manager of the place thought that he was loitering around and decided to have staff ran him off. Many questions formed on the vampire's mind, none of them answered in the short span. Izuku tried to formulate a response, simply stating that he wasn't looking at the people in here with those intentions. I, I wasn't tried being a keyword, for as soon as he did try, he froze. His eyes glazed and Izuku suddenly found himself in a strange state of being. He could not move or do much for that matter. The magenta-colored teen removed his hand from Izuku's shoulder and pointed his hand to the exit door of the shop. Pay up for what you consumed and fuck off. A harsh command, as if Izuku had been a delinquent committing some sort of misdeed, had left the boy. As upset as he was, Izuku could only do as he was told, his body moving automatically. His mind quickly raced, a bubble of excitement surging as he had found another interesting quirk, yet his happiness was cut short as he remembered he was being booted out of the cafe, as if he was some sort of deviant. His body had already left the perfect sum for what he consumed, and he was about to turn and leave. Izuku tried using hemimency to control the flux of his blood and stop his muscles, which somewhat worked. He stopped moving. The other teen widened his eyes a bit, the bags under his lids stretching a bit. His face soon became even more serious, and he rose the tone of his voice. I said, fuck off. Izuku's body doubled down in its efforts to obey the command, but his control over his life force met the strange influence with an iron will. The two forces clashed, Izuku's will demanding his blood to take over his body. The crimson liquid inside his veins responded violently, piercing the muscles underneath his skin, and forcibly stopping any other attempt at movement that wasn't born out of Izuku's own wish. Immediately, his consciousness seemed to snap back into place as Izuku once more had full control of his body. What the hell was that? Izuku exclaimed, the pain of shredded muscle not bothering him as high-speed regeneration kicked in and healed the damage. The other teen was aghast, wondering fearfully how someone could ever escape the grasp of his ability. The other customers began murmuring as they waited for the scene to play out. Izuku focused his eyes on the teen in front of him, the boy also staring him. The vampire opened his mouth, the other teen already preparing to once more take control over him. I'm so sorry. The hemimincer said, bowing his head in shame. His staring had probably made the people around him uncomfortable. Altad Izuku was overly adept at reading people, maybe there was something which he overlooked. Maybe it was the way his normally green eyes turned red whenever Izuku was excited about something it could be an infinity of factors, none of which Izuku could read on the faces of those around him, except the lavender-colored teen. I'm sorry if my staring has bothered you. He apologized with genuine intent, even if he felt that he was not at fault here. It was better to take the blame and end it shortly after all. He could take it. He had done it for 14 years. The Lavanda teen glared at him. Think that you are somehow better than us, huh? Just became you apologize, everything will be fine. Coming here and behaving like a creep. 
I have seen many like you, think they are hot stuff, and that all they say will be forgiven just because they said some half-assed apology. The burying words made the vampire's mood drop deeply. How had this teen come to this conclusion when all Izuku had done was apologize? How had the situation scaled up so quickly? Izuku tried to apologize once more, but a fist came his way. Hunter and Six flared up immediately, the counter hit move executed automatically as Izuku's head tilted and his right hand shot up. He dodged the blow that came and answered back, more out of practice than true intent, with a palm strike. The cartilage of the other teen's nose emitted a crunching noise, as Izuku's hand much too easily broke the soft tissue and drew blood. Silence was all too loud inside the cafe, all eyes focused on the duo. Izuku was much too quick in fleeing the shop, leaving in his table more than double the amount of his tab. Shinzo was having a bad day. His morning started up as any other. Waking up, showering, eating breakfast. All the basics of your standard teen in middle school. He left for school and sat on his desk, bidding his classmates the usual fake compliments. He did not get along with his classmates, but he could live with them. Once or twice there was the little joke about his looks. What fault did he have if his hair was naturally like this? The jokes with his appearance were nothing that he truly worried about. There was bound to have someone who would make that little joke. It was bound to come, like the sun was bound to rise and settle. Hey Shinso, my guy. How's it going? Takeda, a rather typical Japanese adolescent lookalike, came to his desk. Mind doing a favor for me? I kinda forgot my lunch at home and, like, totally don't have any money on me right now. But you know Chico of B2, right? He owns me some money, but hasn't paid me. What do you say we politely ask him to pay up? I can even share some of the money with you. A request for him to brainwash someone. It wasn't even 10 in the morning. A little joke for Takeda and his group to laugh about, display Shinso as if he was some sort of fucking villain. It truly did infuriate him. However, he maintained his calm and rejected the offer. He was not petty to use his powers for some dipshit moronic reason like that. He was not a villain. When he was asked about his high school option, his immediate response was UA, to which many laughed, stating that his quirk was perfectly suited for a villain. God, did he hate school. After another stressful day in school, all that he wanted was to relax. He texted his father and mother to let them know that he was going to his usual cat cafe, where he could vent some stress by being surrounded by cute kittens. Having their permission, Shinso headed straight to Nekapar, his mood already improving at the mere sight of the shop. He hoped that Vanilla would let him patter today. Shinso was an avid frequenter of this shop, and as such he knew the staff quite well. The cafe was full of people, but that was nothing for him. However, there was something new in there today. A teen, someone that Shinso had never seen here. If that was all, he would have ignored the new arrival. More and new customers meant that the shop was doing good, which was always a plus. The problem was that Shinso could not spot Vanilla anywhere. He ordered his coffee and waited patiently for the sight of the white cat, but she was truly evasive today. To distract himself, he glanced about the shop for something new. And then he found Vanilla, the cat staring firmly at the new kid, a pale and green-haired dude. Shinso became somewhat annoyed at the greenette's lack of attention. When a cat stared at you that way it meant that it approved of you and would climb on your lap. Shinso was mature enough to not be truly bothered by it. He focused his eyes on the green. The more time passed, more and more did his annoyance build up as he observed the other teen and his somewhat unusual behavior. He kept glancing around, eyes focusing on other people as if analyzing them for something. And then it clicked inside Shinso's mind. The nerve of this guy. To come here and be a creep on the girls. Not if Shinso had a say in this. He would scare off the guy, a single use of his power ought to do it. Not really, considering that now Shinso had a broken nose to nurse. The green had broken out of his control, and when Shinso decided to get physical, the guy was much too quick to him to react, even when he was the one to surprise attack. He may have jumped the gun on that one, considering that instead of causing a scene and harming the fame of the shop, the other guy had fled. All witnesses would proclaim that Shinso had been the overly aggressive one, and with reason. He had done exactly what he hated, jumping to conclusions way too quick about something he did not know. And now Vanilla was actively avoiding him. Truly, Shinso was having a bad day. Izuku tried to get his breathing in control. His usual exercises were all but useless. Hunter instincts were still active, much of it due to the still fresh blood that was caking his hand. The smell of the crimson liquid was too enticing to pass up. Izuku did try his hardest, but his mouth was salivating too much for him to resist. It wasn't his fault. He was not at wrong. He was not a creep. He had rushed away from the shop to avoid further conflict and harm. The first thing he did was run to the room he had rented. It was not his plan to use the room, but now he needed a place to be away from everyone. Izuku did his best to avoid tainting the liquid with anything else. At this point it was useless to fight hunter instincts, so he would do his best to suppress the inner beast. Feeding with moderation on packaged blood did suppress most of his thirst, but there was nothing compared to the real deal. And so, like he was appreciating like wine, Izuku licked the blood off his hand, not wasting one drop. 
As it traveled down his throat, Izuku could feel the awakening of his inner beast. However, it was different from usual. He ran to the bathroom and looked at himself in front of the mirror. Blazing red and slit pupils, fangs gleaming with saliva and blood, but still mostly himself. Yet something was different. Feeding from fresh blood had triggered something. Izuku could feel it. Something almost hypnotical. Almost as if he could brainwash someone if he looked at them. It seemed as if tonight, Izuku was going to be running high. His instincts begging for him to initiate a hunt. The night was long the vampire, his body running high due to the finally receiving a fresh dose of blood. How long had it been since Izuku had tasted fresh blood? Years for sure. Such abstinence was more than commendable, it was downright impossible. Yet none of that mattered now, considering that Izuku had possibly discovered a new aspect of his quirk. The National Quirk Registry has yet to properly name his quirk, given its rather unique set of abilities. As such, his quirk had been put under the generic brands of a dual vampiric hemimincer quirk, akin to the likes of Vlad King. Izuku could feel the new blood awakening something primal, something that was new, yet was supposed to have always been with him. The team could feel in his mind ever so faint traces of the other guy's memories, annoyance, fear, hope. Many emotions that made his head spin and his instincts to flare, so similar they were to his own. Running with such a high could lead to a dangerous situation, hence the reason why Izuku had locked himself in his rented room. He sat on the cheap mattress, trying out all his breathing exercises. All the techniques that had helped him deal with the thirst for years now failed him miserably. Izuku never felt his body leaving the mattress and standing up. Dressing his shoes and jacket. Hell, he only came to full consciousness when he was already out of the room, and running at full speed atop the many rooftops of the district. His form was all but a blur for the average eye, Flash step aiding in his vicious search for any trace of fighting. The sky was already dark outside, which meant he had lost the count of time when he entered his room, and when he left again. One thing was certain, Izuku would find the target of his hunt. It took him the better part of two hours before Izuku found a current conflict. As always, it happened in a dark alley. A man dressed in a leather, black-colored combat suit and motorbike helmet was exiting the place, going for the empty back street. He was armed with a worrisome number of blades, and if Izuku's nose was right, such blades had recently cut into flesh and drawn blood. Izuku stalked the man for a while, following him as he quickly made his way through countless alleys and shady streets. The man entered a rather cheap-looking building, Izuku opting to take a scenic approach, and climbing the sidewalks with windows, his nails sinking into the concrete to allow him access to perches when none were available. The smell of blood was an easy trail for the vampire to follow, his already excited senses going into overdrive as the smell increased, this time with a subtle difference. Izuku could almost taste blood in the air, and he could not climb fast enough to reach his target. When he finally reached the window of the fifth floor, Izuku found himself staring at a common bathroom. The room was bare, only filled with the essentials such as soap and shampoo, but the teen could also spot a bottle of bleach, likely an effort in trying to erase the traces of life liquid from whatever tools this person had been working on. Another glance and the hemimincer found the sink, the sight of it making his nose flare, and pupils sharpen until Izuku gained a frightening look. Blood. A knife. A nose. The sight captured his attention long enough for a hand to suddenly appear into vision. The glove's hand broke the window glass pane much too fast, striking and grabbing it. Izuku grunted in pain, but quickly got into a striking stance. There was only one tiny lamp lighting the room, but it gave him enough sight to make out the would-be attacker. His nose flared and his mouth watered, the sight making Izuku both fearful and thirsty. The man had a sharp face, black hair and eyes containing a powerful will, but those details paled in comparison to his nose, or the location where the cartilaginous mass would be. Instead, a massive gash slowly bled, making the man both easy and hard to recognize. A kid? I thought someone like Eraserhead had finally managed to track me down. No worries though, I'll just have you sleep while I change hideouts. The man spoke in a low grunt, slowly grabbing the knife from the sink. Don't make this harder than it has to be, kid. The man charged Izuku with a burst of speed the Greenette had some trouble following. The duo engaged into a dangerous fight, the man slashing at Izuku with precision and strength, all of which failed to cut it in by millimeters. The teen tried to use his nails, but found himself forced into a defensive battle, as his opponent also drew a sword to aid his endeavor of cutting Izuku. The teen disengaged from the close quarters by jumping back, his nails sinking into the flesh of his arms, and quickly drawing blood. The man seemed surprised by Izuku's actions, and was almost caught in the surprise attack the teen planned, the blood gauntlets missing their target, as Izuku buried his covered fists into the wall behind the dangerous man. The teen tried to dodge the incoming knives thrown his way, and mostly did. Unfortunately, Izuku found himself acquainted to the man's sword handle, a resounding crack echoing in the room as Izuku's nose broke under the blow. The green-haired youth recoiled in pain and was not fast enough to avoid the second blow, a sword burying into his right shoulder with no mercy. Right after that, the blade was brutally yanked from his shoulder as a boot stomped on his abdomen and sent the hemimincer into the ground as a sprawled mess. 
Izuku grunted in pain, his cracked shoulder blade already healing the damage and allowing the muscles to knit themselves back into place. He tried to stand and fight, but suddenly Izuku found his body locked in place. Differently from the purple-haired teen's quirk, Izuku found his muscles to be truly in lockdown. It was a bad choice for you to search for me, kid. You are lucky to go with only a shoulder injury, only a true hero will be able to defeat me. Only All Might will bring me down, and until the day that happens, the teen found the sensation of losing control of his body to be both frightening and annoying. The footsteps of the man approached him and stopped right next to him. Izuku felt his hair be grasped, and his head was turned to face the man until they were both looking into each other's eyes. Izuku could feel the man judging him, hoping to see fear into his green eyes. The true ancestor would not allow this villainous man to jug him. He might not be able to move his body, but he could still feel his connection with his life liquid. Advanced hemimancy was called upon, hunter instincts flaring up in response to the judging red eyes of this man. Izuku's own pupils shone and glimmered in crimson light, as the duo's stare competition prolonged. His blood responded to his call, his injured shoulder being the exit necessary for the crimson liquid to burst from, immediately sharpening into blades and attacking his assailer. The man jumped back in surprise, his blade parrying the many tendrils of blood that Izuku controlled well down. Ten different attacks, from ten different directions. Such aggression would overwhelm any B-tier hero, yet the man was capable enough to avoid any sort of injury. After jumping to avoid the tendrils, the man decided to back off. Izuku was about to extend the range of his blood tendrils, but found his muscles to be free of their force control. It seemed that the quirk of this villain had a time limit, considering that only five minutes had passed since Izuku had been paralyzed. The teen rose from the ground and once more got into a fighting stance, ready for his round two. The villain rose his brows and muttered a somewhat pleased noise. Oh, it seems your spirit is made of stronger stuff than those fakes out there. I'll applaud your tenacity for sure. I'll wait and see if you will be able to keep that spirit of yours and become a true hero. The man said, never dropping his guard or showing any openings that Izuku could see. He slowly backed off, but Izuku slowly followed him, keeping their distance equal to before. Don't hurt yourself anymore, kid. I want to see what kind of hero you'll become in the future. Show it to me then, now you need to rest and take care of that injure. The villain caught his speech short as he noticed that Izuku's shoulder was already healed. His smile became much too large, his tongue snaking out like his sword, where there was still blood from when he cut Izuku earlier. Before the teen could wonder why the man would ingest blood, the same sensation of muscle lockdown happened and Izuku fell once more, this time face first into the ground of the bathroom. He heard the sound of another window opening up, and then the apartment fell into complete silence. Izuku felt somewhat hollow, being subdued so easily by a villain. He had messed up a lot this time, letting his instincts get the better of him, and allowing them to run rampart, had been what led to his current state of defeat, paralyzed into the bathroom of a killer for who knows how long. The vampire felt like an incompetent child. Why had Izuku thought that he could take on the man with his piss-poor combat skills? Sure, his hunter instincts was a top-notch predator skill that could cover for a lot of his inexperience in combat, but relying so heavily into them, had led into him getting a sword to his shoulder. Izuku could still feel where the blade had dung into, the cold bite of the jagged metal already been healed. He reflected into the fight, his mind easily replaying the events and pointing where and how he had messed up, and how he could have done better, had he maintained his rationality and calm mind. Yet, Izuku had given into the thirst and allowed himself to rampage. How could a mere lick of fresh blood have caused much an effect on him? Five minutes passed and his freedom of movement returned, allowing Izuku to pick himself from the cold ground. He sniffed the air in hopes of finding the villain, but his efforts were for naught. All he picked up was the smell of blood hanging from the bathroom sink, where the man had apparently done some sort of self-harm. The green-haired teen couldn't help his mouth watering up, shivers of pleasure running up and down his spine, as the sweet smell of blood wafted into his nose. Izuku approached the sink and, his hand smearing the blood and approaching it to his nose for a better inspection of the blood. Sweet. His mouth watering even more, his earlier defeat completely forgotten, Izuku brought the crimson liquid to his mouth for a taste of the nectar. As he licked his hands clean, Izuku ignored the severed appendage at the bottom of the sink, in favor of appreciating the taste of fresh blood in his mouth. His eyes glimmered, pupils like rubies. The vampire delighted himself in the taste, his own blood screaming in happiness, as it broke down the nutrition it received. His fangs shone, reflecting the light of the room, and Izuku caught a glimpse of himself on the mirror above the sink. He froze. The monster was staring back. The sun shone without a care, bringing its light for all. The curtains of the room were open without a care for the wishes of the occupant of said room, allowing the sunlight to touch the exposed arm of the person covered in blankets. The woman who entered the room stood at the door, waiting for the usual to happen. A few seconds passed before the blankets were thrown in the air without a care, the teen under them rushing to escape the light that invaded his space without regards his wishes. Izuku hissed at the window, staring hatefully at the light that entered his room for a few seconds. His nose picked up the scent of his mother standing by the doorframe. 
He breathed deeply, clamping the urge to close his curtains down, and slowly making his way out of his room. Good morning, mom. Izuku said, tiredly dragging his body out of his room and making his way to the kitchen. Morning, Izuku. Inko sweetly replied, following him. The duo made their way to the kitchen. Inko sitting herself on her usual place as Izuku, proceeded to his mini fridge and grabbed three blood packs, making his way to his place where breakfast was already served. The mother and son clapped their hands and giving the usual thanks for the meal, began eating slowly as the TV droned the usual spiel. Inko began eating and observing her son. He had returned earlier than she expected, making his way to his room without much fuss and somewhat worrying her. His earlier than expected was 3 in the morning, so of course the mother was worried. Her Izuku was growing, Inko realized, but she was not sure what to do if he was going to make excuses to meet girls in the night. Why else would he come home at such time and so down, if not for a rejection? As for the teen, he sank his fangs into the blood packs and quickly drank the contents, his brows frowning when the crimson liquid touched his tongue. Land. Like drinking miso soup without any condiments put into it. He usually would only drink one pack, two if particularly stressed. Yet, even after draining his third pack, Izuku only felt satiated. Barely enough to keep his thirst into check. He ate his food without putting much thought into it, and after being done, placed his dishes into the sink and started washing them. His ears picked the sound of his mother coming close, which she did as he put her dishes next to his, and patted his shoulder to gain his attention. Izuku almost flinched, had his mother known. Izuku. You must present your girlfriend to you mom. I need to know what kind of girl my baby boy is going out with. Her jovial tone made Izuku release a sigh, a smile soon settling over his lips as his green pupils focused on hers. Yes, mom. He felt some blood flow to his cheeks, a light blush staining his pale features. He loved his mother. She was the archer of his life. Izuku made his way to Dagaba Beach. Skull had finished a few minutes ago, the pale vampire using flash stepping his way to the sandy junkyard that was completely littered with trash. After searching for a while, the teen found that this place became like this due to the sea, bringing out some junk to the shores, after which some thought it was a good idea to use the place as a sort of dump. The teen started coming here since two months ago, following the incident where the villainous man happened. Since the place was avoided due to the mountains of trash that covered it, it was a perfect place for him to go and empty his mind. The smell of rusty iron was somewhat akin to that of blood, making the beach a good spot for Izuku to train. That's right, train. The teen realized that suppressing his instincts had been a great mistake. After his incident, he began searching ways to get a better control over his instincts and urges, but the internet could only give him so much. Blood quirks were usually feared, meaning that information on them was either exaggerated or false, few articles being useful for the teen. As such, Izuku went with the tried and true method of experimentation. Finding the litter to Gaba Beach had helped him greatly in that aspect, as the smell of rusty iron tickled his hunter instincts and allowed the teen to blow off steam. He could practice his advanced hemimancy without fear of hurting anyone, and in the rare chance that he went in a rampage, he had plenty of targets to destroy until he calmed down. All in all, it also served as practice for the upcoming UA entry exam that he planned on taking. It would not do too for him to enter a blood haze and attack the other competitors, so Izuku slowly began experimenting with all he could think of. So far he had great profit from his endeavors here, considering that he managed to mostly tame his more aggressive tendencies. However, his thirst had increased as to compensate for his continuous use of Daywaker, advanced hemimancy and hunter instincts. His control over his blood also increased, allowing him to make his blood seep through his skin pores, and surpassing the need to open wounds to have access to his blood. It was slower to do, but also less aggravating too on the eyes of anyone else. And the final touch, his most recent abilities. Izuku was aware that biting people to suck their blood was wrong, and would garner him much distrust, should he do much thing in front of other people, but he could not ignore the benefits of drinking fresh blood. Packaged blood was tasting blander and blander by as the days passed, it also lacked the active cork factor present in fresh blood. Izuku didn't know when it happened or how, but his best guess was that after his ingestion of fresh blood. He developed some extra abilities after he tasted fresh blood. It seemed to have some sort of restriction, considering that he had not developed something like his mother's quirk of attraction of small objects as a child, or maybe his quirk was not mature enough at that point. Whatever the case, Izuku guessed that depending on the quirk, if he ingested the blood of the person, he could duplicate the effects. It was much less potent than the original, but it could be done. Izuku found that out in school. He mostly forgot the details of the encounter, but he remembered it had to deal with Bakugou's lackeys. The blonde bomber had left Izuku alone these days, but the sickly sweet smell of nitroglycerin had become stronger, a sign that Katsuki was also training to participate in the upcoming exams. Yet, the lackeys who clung to the ash blonde saw fit to deepen their friendship with the blonde and in their heads, that somehow meant bothering the resident vampire Valderic Jr. 
Due to that, the long fingers lanky quirk user and wings fatty quirk user had chosen to bother Izuku when he stayed late to write some details in his quirk notebook. Before they even got the chance to bother him, his green pupils shone in crimson light as Izuku decided to test if he could really reproduce the effects of other people's quirks. The result. Two new abilities that Izuku decided to cal mesmerize in coagulation. Both were useful in their ways, but were inferior copies of the original abilities of the people he had obtained them from. Mesmerize was obtained after Izuku drank from the purple-haired teen's blood, and was a form of hypnotism. It was tricky to use, considering that Izuku needed to maintain full focus eye contact with his target, and it was still hard for him to truly control others. At best he could give simple instructions, and those needed to be something that the target believed was their own idea. It was a hard to use ability, but Izuku could make it do with it. Coagulation was easier to use. If he could let some of his blood enter someone's bloodstream, Izuku could make his blood paralyze someone for a short period of time. Quite useful for fights, although Izuku needed to have people ingest his blood for it to work. He wondered if he could get new abilities by drinking more blood from different sources, but such occasions would surely be hard to come by. It was not like he could go around asking people if he could drink their blood. That would be weird. Izuku continued training, thoughts running in his mind as he slashed at the piles of scrap with his blood gauntlets, sending metal bits flying and breaking parts of bigger machines. The noise of it covered the sound of the person that approached him, the smell being covered due to the grease and oil that was stuck on the skin of the person. The vampire was caught by surprise when someone touched his shoulder, making him spin around, counter-attack ready, as his gauntlet-covered hands aimed to strike at whoever managed to get this close without his notice. His sharp fingers barely managed to stop before the girl in front of him, pink dreadlocks flying due to the air pressure created by his suddenly stopped motion. Hey there. I noticed that you were breaking these things apart, and I wondered if you couldn't help me out with those other ones over there. How about it, huh? Izuku found himself being requested a favor by a girl. Whatever in hell was a girl doing in this dump was anyone's guess, but her get-up seemed to point the possibility of her being a mechanic. The goggles atop her head and the tool belt strapped around her waist were dead giveaways to that. One question though. Are these gauntlets metal? Or maybe they are your quirk. They are quite resilient, but don't seem to be made of metal, so maybe they are some sort of nail alloy. Or carbon base. Tell me about them. Oh, about my request, could you do it? It won't take much of your time, promise. I would dismantle them, but some of the screws rusted, and the only way to get the inner machinery is to break them open. The girl kept talking over Izuku, not allowing the vampire any chance to give an answer to any of her question. She truly machine gunned him down with words, getting close to his personal space, and grinning as he seemed to bounce in place, her side-shaped pupils running all over his blood gauntlets. Izuku felt overwhelmed. Oh, I almost forgot. Conversations start only when you introduce yourself, right well, my name is Mei, Hatsune Mei. Now, could you break that washing machine over there? Izuku felt truly overwhelmed. Ah, uh, finally done. A teenager exclaimed, stretching his arms backwards and emitting satisfying popping sounds from both his back and shoulders. Izuku had been taking his time to study for the upcoming UA exams, and as such, he could not neglect the fact that UA didn't just focus on physical aspects, but also in academics too. The last three months until the exam he had dialed back his night strolls, since he managed to get a much better grasp on his abilities. The thirst was still the same, the little voice at the edge of his mind reminding Izuku that he was far from perfect. Much too far. Yet, the pale boy continued his path. He also had eased his training routine. Since his encounter with Hatsune Mei all those months ago, he had not had a full moment he could call his own. The techie girl was incessant in her efforts to have him help her with her inventions, or better said, her babies. Izuku swore that he could never get used to the girl's erratic behavior. After he had helped her in their first encounter, she had hacked into his phone and had added her own info contact, including her bloody address. Day in and day out of his training, Izuku had been forced to help the girl carry ludicrous amounts of trash from the beach to her workshop, about 10 miles away from the littered part of the beach. It had been greater workout routine than anything he had planned so far, so he did not blame the girl or had any true malice towards her. Besides, it helped that she talked so much, as her voice could distract him from his own thoughts. Bonus points that she was always covered in sweat and grease, which did not trigger hunter instincts, and didn't make him wish to jump at her neck each five minutes. Make no mistake, Mei was attractive in her own right, with her frantic behavior, and well, she was more developed than the majority of the girls he had seen in his school. Coupled with her lack of respect for personal space, and it made for some unusual moments. Lucky for him, motor oil was truly difficult to get off the skin, thus he only needed to focus on that when the pink-haired girl got too close for comfort. He sighed. His habit of letting too many ideas swim in his head had gotten him thinking about nonsense again. As puberty came, so did the increase in his hormones and instincts. At his quirk's less than stellar ability in hunter instincts, it you could end with a troublesome combination of testosterone and adrenaline. Ping. Talk about the devil and he shall appear. 
Izuku joked inside his head, grabbing his phone and opening the text he had been sent. Another request from Mei, this time asking for him to grab some random trinket she had forgotten by the junkyard of the beach. Izuku sighed, but complied and sent a confirmation to the girl. She had been his first friend in a while, and the fact that she did not mind his weird appearance or why he seemed to have exposed for too long into the sun. Daywalker could cover up when Izuku was dressed up, but most of his exercises required him to shed the maximum amount of clothing possible, so that he could push his abilities even further. He picked a hoodie from his wardrobe and left him room. His mother was in the living room, watching some rom-com that he had no interest in. Hey mom, I need to pick something for my friend. I'll be back soon. He said, already by the door and putting in his red sneakers. Isn't it quite late Izu? How about you pick that up tomorrow? Inko worriedly asked, her gaze shifting to his frame. The vampire waved off the concerns of his mother, giving her his best smile. His fangs gleamed and his gaze was more of a predator than a caring son, but his mother knew him enough to know what he truly meant. The woman kept her eyes locked into his frame for a few seconds before she exhaled tiredly, giving him her sweet smile. One that would not send children running away. Okay, Aizu, but if anything happens, call me immediately. Don't even think about vanishing into the night and coming here the next morning as if nothing ever happened. She warned, her voice laced with concern for him. He supposed she was talking about the night he came home suffering blood withdrawal. It only happened when he went long periods of time without ingesting any blood. Or when he was cultivating foreign blood inside him, hoping to emulate other quirks. It was not pretty sight to see her here, but it was something that he could at least mitigate. He hadn't spent that money into those alter UV lights in vain, after all. Sure mom. Love you. He assured her and exited their apartment, quick steps guiding his body into Tagaba Beach's way by pure muscle memory. The night truly was the moment when Izuku shined, his body working at its best to provide him all the power of a vampire, to the enhanced senses, and all the spiel of his hemimency. Triple X. It was thanks to those senses that Izuku was now sneaking around the beach, his frame hidden behind old and rusty cars, washing machines and all sorts of machinery one might think of. You might be asking yourself why would he be hiding like some sort of burglar. The question was very simple. His hunter instincts were going crazy, his nose flaring up to pick the smell of his favorite drink. It was not rust, which slightly stimulated his appetite, but it was the smell of the crimson honey that was his nectar and curse. Blood. Old blood, that had been cleaned away with bleach countless times from the metal blade, which had drawn the life liquid away from the owner of it. A bladed tool for sure. Izuku had only smelled that much blood in two people, none of which had been friendly when the vampire the last time he had met them. Which begged the golden question as of why would Stain be here? Had he remembered Izuku and DC did to finish the job from before? Izuku did some research before to find information on the man he had fought that fabled night, when he had acquired mesmerize and coagulation. A villain, or anti-hero as some in the internet called him, Stain was known for his recent acts of purging those who he saw unfit to be heroes. His ideas about true heroism had been spreading around the web, slowly gaining support from fans of his ideology. Pushing all those thoughts aside, the vampire regained his focus, making sure to carefully make his way where the smell of blood was at its strongest. He hid behind one old car frame, closing his eyes to fully focus in his ears. Ba-chan, can you go out with me? The voice of a teenager reached Izuku's voice. The Hemimincer was instantly confused as to why would a young boy be here at this time, much less confessing love for a man like Stain. Nininichiro Senpai, are you really in love with me? With Lilalmi. The cheer childish joy and giggling coming from the other person was not masculine. In fact, the tone was so feminine that Izuku could picture in his mind the type of person who would speak like that as a cute cowhai. One tiny peek and he found that the girl receiving that confession was much different from whom he had in mind. There was also the little fact that she was a villain he had run into a few months back. It took all his willpower to force his body still, lest he jump and attack her out of sheer instinct. It was really weird for a guy to be making a confession at this time, in this dump. Izuku was not the leading expert in dates or romance, but he pictured that a date must be somewhere that the girl would enjoy spending time at. Unless this girl enjoyed rust and trash, Izuku doubted this was the most appropriate place for this. The vampire continued hidden, waiting for any other development, but this time he made sure to pick his phone and start silently recording the happenings here. So, Nichiro Senpai, what is it that enjoy in me? My good looks. Or is it my personality? Oh. I got it it's my sexy body, right? The blonde squealed in delight, her hands joined together as she swooned at the not at all romantic shenanigan happening. The boy smiled, one hand scratching the back of his head, while the other went for his back pocket. Toga-chan, I enjoy everything in you. The way you talk, how cute you look in the morning, how wonderful you will look when I break you. Izuku narrowed his brows at the rather sudden shift in tone and mood. He began to let his blood out, the crimson liquid slowly seeping through the pores and skin of his arms to make his gauntlets. It seemed that Izuku had the devil's luck to stumble into these situations. I don't know, senpai. I think you will look pretty cute bleeding out too. 
When the blonde, whom Izuku now knew when by Toga, spoke out, the duo stayed in their standoff for a while, no one moving. And then it happened. Nichiro's right arm whipped into Toga's direction, electric sparks flying from the stun gun in his hand. His appearance of a middle school boy disappearing into mist as he turned into a grown man dressed in a suspiciously decked out attire. Combat pants and boots, coupled with a military grade vest and a black hoodie, made the man menacing. Izuku could also spot some handcuffs, another stun gun, what Izuku hoped to be a smoke grenade and a nightstick. Toga, on the other hand, drew knives hidden in the long sleeves of her sailor's uniform. The blonde girl immediately threw her weapons at the man to make some distance, before drawing another pair from a strap hidden under her skirt. The man dodged the knives thrown his way and poised himself, drawing his nightstick and extending it. If you give up nice and easy, I'll promise to make this painless. Damage goods sell for lower prices, you see. It's all business, so if you don't mind. Nichiro joked about, twirling his metal stick and slowly circling around the girl. Toga opened an even bigger smile on her part, her predatory eyes never allowing the man out of sight. You see, senpai. Himiko here is such a cutie that the big men up there need to send goons like you to try to get her attention. That's not cute at all. You will be cuter when you start bleeding. The blonde declared, suddenly sprinting towards the armed man. The duo began exchanging attacks and testing the range of their weapons. Himiko was agile and nimble, her knives almost dancing as they tried to tear into Nichiro. The man had longer reach due to his stature, but he could not overextend, else Toga would be sure to bury a knife deep into his gut. The things we do for money. The man let the thought fly in his head. He had found Himiko walking around late at night close to the hotel areas, where young high school girls sometimes sold their bodies for some cash. It was much more subdued these days, hero patrols and all that jazz, but you could still find Yasul some young flesh selling itself for a quick buck. Or in other cases, the big shots offered money to dealers for them to provide high-quality meat. Nichiro had stalked Himiko for a few days, even infiltrating her school to acquire some extra info and sell her off. When he exposed some pictures of her to some of his buyers, they became enchanted with the wild beauty of the blonde. Their messy style or whatever they said at that time, Nichiro, or going by his real name Amami Hirodo, only paid attention when the old farts mentioned the amount they would buy her. Abusing the hell out of his quirk, fake out, Amami could easily infiltrate the school under the disguise of any student. A mere touch and for three hours he could pretend to be whoever person he touched. It was a mitter type quirk that displayed the illusion of being someone else, but it could be identified in many ways. Smell and touch were only some of the many ways he had been figured out, hence why he opted to carry with him his weapons. A shocked and paralyzed meat slave was much easier to deal with than the panther like Himiko. The duo continued their engagement, Amamiya coming many times close to Zap the blonde, but she continued being able to escape and dodge both his weapons. The man was becoming irritated by their stalemate, already having received some nicks and cuts from the girl. Deciding he had had enough of their little game, Amamiya backed off quickly, Himiko following him before he could disengage. A pity for her this had been a bait. He let the nightstick fall to the ground as he pulled something else from his vest. Himiko stopped her knives a few centimeters away from cutting into Amamiya's throat. The reason was that now she was staring at the rifle barrel of a revolver. Those few seconds turned Himiko's world into a pain-filled fiesta, as 50,000 volts of electric energy ran over all her body, making her first tightly clench her weapons, before letting them go, and falling into the sand below her like a puppet whose strings had been cut. All that she saw before she went unconscious were two crimson pupils shining above Amamiya, green hair obscuring the face of the new rival into the fight. Her last recurring thoughts were. How pretty. Here, eat this please. Izuku said, his hands coming around and clamping around the man's mouth. With a vice-like grip, the vampire held the man in place, blood seeping from a cut on his palm directly in the assailant's mouth. Amamiya tried to attack, but his muscles locked into place almost immediately after he tasted the coppery taste of blood on his tongue, signaling that coagulation had taken effect. That done, Izuku brought the man close to his face, locking eyes with him. Amamiya tried his best to resist, but his body could not obey any of his commands, and soon he found himself staring the ruby-colored gleaming eyes of the beast in front of him. Yes, beast, for there was no man capable of having that kind of piercing gaze. The gaze of a true predator. You shall not resist, neither shall you attack. Your better has arrived and he demands your full submission. Fail to effectively comply to my command and your body shall be found tomorrow in this very beach, sucked dry of all life. The words that left Izuku's mouth echoed inside Amami's head, slowly engulfing his mind with thoughts of submission and passive behavior. Like sheep being led to a slaughterhouse by the wolf. The man ceased his struggle, a red haze consuming his vision as he stood still, ready to receive whatever judgment the vampire imposed on him. After Izuku made sure that the attacker would not move, courtesy of Mesmerize, he went to check on the girl. It was not an excuse to make some distance between him and the helpless bloodbag in front of him, no sir. 
Mind tricks and intimidation were tactics Izuku was willing to use, considering they were rather effective when coupled together with his appearance. Bakugou was a prime example that intimidation tactics were mighty effective. Even threats such as the one he just made were acceptable, so long as Izuku kept his mind focused on the objective, he would only become a true monster if he did cross the line. Even with all the instincts, that was the one line Izuku swore to himself to never cross, no matter what. Even if the line became shifty or it bordered in villainy, as long as he did not cross it, he was safe. He went to check on the unconscious girl, reminding himself that the blonde was the same girl who was stabbing a man in the past. He checked her pulse and I checked her for any possible injuries, but she seemed mostly fine. She would probably be in a bit of pain after she woke up, after all she was shot pretty good by the stun gun. The vampire took the safe approach and used his blood to form a long tendril, using the bloody appendage to check the blonde for any other hidden weapons. The Hemimincer was somewhat surprised by the sheer number of blades that she was carrying. Not so many as Stain had, but he counted 10 knives so far, though she had thrown earlier out of the mix. After making sure that the blades were out of the girl's reach, Izuku went and made sure she was in a more comfortable position than before, when she was thrown on the ground like a ragdoll. That done, Izuku immediately contacted the police department, telling the nature of the incident, and reporting any details that might be of use to the police. His call done, the vampire also sent a message to Detective Sakeji, hoping for the man to be in service tonight. As the Hemimincer typed, he began his search for the primary objective as to why he had come here in the first place. Maze Rinka turned out to be her steampunk-themed goggles, forgotten by some old refrigerator she had stripped for spare parts. Little wrench monkey as she was, the girl must not have noticed the moment when the goggles slipped away from her head. God knew why she wore the design, considering that her quirk, zoom, allowed her to see up to about 5 kilometers. Pocketing the goggles, Izuku texted the mechanic girl, and turned around to see the condition of his capturees. The man was still unmoving, the effects of coagulation long done, but thanks to Mesmerize, he had no need to worry about him, so long as nothing bumped into him. Toga, no the other hand, was out of sight. Izuku tensed himself, worry painting his face. The girl should have been out for a longer period, considering she took such a shock. The vampire's ears picked the faint sound of movement, and he quickly turned to meet the cause, even as his instincts remained calm, and told him nothing was there. Izuku did not see anyone, but he could hear the sound. Someone was stalking him, moving with extremely quiet footsteps, and he knew it must have been Toga. Yet, no matter what he did, Hunter Insects did not pick her presence or intent. It was like the girl was invisible or non-existent. This led to him receiving a palm strike on his chin, the blow snapping his head back. Following that, a roundhouse kick on the gut threw Izuku back a few centimeters, his feet digging groves on the sandy floor as he huffed. His head snapped into the direction he heard movement, this time he finally managed to spot the girl. She was panting, an obvious sign that she was not well, but that did not make her any less dangerous, considering she had managed to pick up some of her weapons. Izuku stood still, hoping to not aggravate the situation. Well pan pant it seems like tonight everyone wants a piece of cute all Himiko H.E.R.E. Toga exclaimed, trying to estabilize her breathing. Her hands were trembling, the girl doing her best to appear both threatening and charming. Both of which she was not successfully accomplishing right now. Izuku did not know what he was due to hear. Any movement from his part would appear suspicious, and he had looked out that Toga's kick had done been that powerful. She packed some force for sure, but the vampire was more inconvenienced by her ability to suddenly disappear than her strength. His focus had not been broken, nor had the girl touched her assailant, which meant that his mental control over him was still intact. He tried to maintain fixed eyesight with the girl, but it seemed that she had somehow picked up on his little trick. The vampire opted to not say anything, allowing the girl to slowly regain her breath. If he could simplify this situation, he would describe it in chess terms as being in check. He could try and restrain her, but she was a much better close-range fighter than he was. There was also the fact his hunter instincts were being triggered, seeing such defenseless prey in front of him, trying to act tough. Two blood bags ready to be consumed. No. I can't think like that. The teen chastised himself, biting his lower lip to increase his focus. Letting his instincts run wild was dangerous, for both himself and others. Not going to confess your love. You look so pretty before, the red eyes and the whole I am the night vibe was really was getting me going. How sad Himiko tried teasing, her Cheshire grin making the vampire tighten his face features. He tried to get a sentence going, his pearly white fangs attracting the attention of the blonde. Whoa. You got fangs too. How C-U-T so C-U-T. If you were bleeding just a tiny bit, I would totally fall in love with you, like, right N-O-W. This, I have called for Izuku almost said police, but stopped himself at the last second. He should not waste a chance, considering the girl was engaging him in conversation. The more time passed, the closer the police got to the beach. She could regain some breath back, but there was no way she was going to recuperate enough to escape the cops, not after that shock. Luckily, Himiko had not noticed his little slip-up, or so he hoped. She was where had she gone? 
down, bellow. Hunter instincts warned him just in time, Izuku managing to protect his chin from the incoming knife. The blade pierced the palm of his left hand and stopped his shy of touching his Adam's apple, his right hand automatically springing to grab what he perceived to be a presence right in front of him, successfully managing to grab the blonde by her throat. The vampire sucked in his breath, the pain hitting him right away, but it was not enough for him to get distracted. Some blood seeped out, but instead of dripping away, the liquid wrapped around the blade and its handle, locking it in place before Himiko could ever think of pulling it away. Himiko's eyes widened, gaining a glint of childish joy, as she eyed the vibrant crimson liquid move, as if it had a will of its own. Her eyes followed as Izuku slowly lowered his hand and bringing with it the pocket knife that had sank into his flesh. Her pale features gained a staining blush as her eyes shifted from the wound in the vampire's hand to his eyes, previously emerald green, now glimmering rubies filled with violent power. She could feel as if invisible hands were trying to worm their way inside her mind, meditating whispers of a husky voice telling her to stand down and bow to a higher power. As Izuku fought the instinct to sink his fangs into Toga's soft-looking neck, he opened his mouth to speak, warm vapor steaming away and revealing once more the white fangs of his mouth. He was fully focused on both controlling himself and trying to mesmerize the villain girl, but her mind seemed to be rejecting his advances. He slowly approached his wounded hand to her mouth, the girl trying to push him back, but failing to overwhelm his strength. Just as the crimson liquid was about to approach the blonde's mouth, a siren blasted off together with red and blue lights. The police had arrived. Izuku's head whipped into the direction of the rising stone stars of the beach, spotting the police car approaching their location. He should have known better. Himiko realized quickly that she could not fight against his raw strength, so she decided to approach the manor in a more flexible way. By that, she meant a double kick to both the vampire's shin and then his crotch. As Izuku recoiled in pain, Himiko let go of the handle of one of her knives, the one buried in the vampire's hand, and the other she sank into the arm holding her neck. As she remembered properly, this cutie was the regenerator who she had met a while back. She was lucky, it seemed he lived in the district. She would remember to be here more often, as she could meet him more she could have another chance of becoming even closer to him. He was even offering her a drink of his blood. And with that Himiko Toga once more escaped the claws of the green-haired vampire. XXXX. Izuku exited the police car and waved a goodbye to the man dressed in a trench coat who was driving. He sighed in defeat, seeing as he failed to get the blonde villain girl into the hands of the authorities, and even received a scolding from Detective Tsukauchi for misuse of his quirk in public. Lucky him the detective let him go with only a scolding and a quick question section, lie detection making any piss-poor excuse invalid. Thus, he was free from having to respond to any lawsuit from the man he had used his quirk on. He entered his apartment and gave a quick greeting to his mother, the woman spending a good 15 minutes checking him to see if he had gotten into any scrap of some sort. The vampire indulged the worried mother, his mind busy wondering why had Toga decided to attack him if she could escape earlier, she was clearly skilled, if that invisibility trick could fool his hunter instincts. Which meant she could pass as non-threatening, as long as she wished for and get into close range. He could pick sounds and smell from her, but with his most reliable sense telling him that there was no threat, it was going to be difficult dealing with her, should they ever encounter again. After his mother was finally pleased, she asked about the trinket he had gone to pick up, upon which he showed her the goggles, and she launched into another full mother scolding about how he should not have gone so late to pick some accessory. It would be another 30 minutes before he was free to go to his room. Izuku dropped into his bed, pulling out two pocket knives hidden in his hoodie and examining them. Simple knives, but highly effective. He wondered if he should add bladed weapons as support items into the design of his hero costume. He had several models, each taking into consideration various situations and his own quirk into account. There were many designs that took direct inspiration from pro heroes such as All Might, Ed Shot, Eraser Head and others. Sometimes Izuku wondered what he would come up with if his quirk was something else, or even if he was quirkless. That was the one question that the vampire would always ask himself. His quirk was a wonderful gift, even considering all the drawbacks it had. How many out there would kill to have high-speed regeneration or hunter instincts, and here he was, wondering if he should be thankful for them. Those were wonderful parts of his quirk, but he could never forget that they came with the unending thirst and quite some violent tendencies. Why am I getting so hang up on this tonight? The vampire asked himself, before coming short for an answer. He decided to shelf the idea in the back of his mind for another day. The UA exams were coming and he should be studying. The big day was finally here. After all the months of preparation, Izuku was getting ready to finally take the next step into his life. He had a full belly today, managing to almost empty his stock of blood bags at home, to make sure he would not be thirsty during the exam. A few days before the exam, the NQA, National Quirk Agency, had taken his recent upgrades into account, his slight manipulation of the truth, as to how he had acquired them non-important now, and finally decided into a proper name for his quirk. 
they felt somewhat silly and a bit chunny, but Izuku felt glad that now he had a proper way to address his power, and medical issues would be less troublesome, when now he could skip the tea tricks of explaining his court to doctors. No, he was not goddamn afraid of still bodies of water or silver, and that yes, he was fine with garlic, no, he could not turn into a swarm of bats. Sometimes people took movies too serious. The train ride to UA was filled with silent enthusiasm, some people giving him a wider berth than necessary, but nothing could spoil this day. They had messaged him about 50 times already, many of the texts being the same pass already, and let me experiment my babies on you. And that broke the nervous tension that the hero trainee hopeful had for his test. He had people who believed in him despite his quirk, so Izuku would do his hardest to meet the expectations of those that believed in him. Nothing could spoil the high mood the vampire had going. Not the many other students looking at him with questioning eyes, not the brightly lit sun that was shining down on his frame. Not even the sight of the ever scowling Bakugou. Get the fuck out of the way, sucker. The ash blonde growled, hands inside the pockets of his deep blue coat. Izuku eyed the bomber from the corner of his eyes, not moving from his spot. There was plenty of space for Kasuki to go around the vampire. That led to a standstill this soon, the two teens looking at each other. Akigu's red eyes fixed into Izuku's greens, the other students avoiding the duo, as if they could feel the tension in the air. One minute seemed like an eternity, Izuku eventually sighed stepping to allow the blonde bomber right away. The other students releasing sighs of relief they did not know they were holding. As Kasuki passed by Izuku, the vampire decided to poke some fun at the walking bomb. A simple smile, making sure that his white fangs were in display. Akigu stopped for a moment, a growl leaving his throat, as his head turned to meet the smiling face of the Hemimincer. Hope you are ready to get squashed, mosquito. With that, Bakugu made his way to his entry point, leaving Izuku behind. The vampire got his fill of the entry gates of Yue, saving the memory in his head. As he made his way inside the building, he never noticed the group that was stopped still behind him. The brown-haired girl with a bob-cut style, a boy with deep red and spiked hair close to pink-skinned girl, and a raven-faced boy, were the most notable teens among the group, yet all of them only had one thought running in their heads. That's the level that Yue is operating at. That's crazy. Izuku sat in his seat after the three-hour-long test. It was the kind of test you would expect of Yue, full of laborious and difficult question, but the vampire was sure that he had scored high enough. After all the students were done, many complaining about the difficulty of the written portion, they were all directed to a large room with a stage at the bottom. Funnily enough, Izuku's arranged seat was right beside Bakugu, who was grinding his teeth and seemed ravenous to be seated beside the vampire. A few minutes and the stage was lit up, as was the projector behind it, present Mick being illuminated. The blonde hero began his presentation with his usual upbeat attitude that never seemed to be put down. He loudly explained the physical portion of the exam, the screen projection behind him displaying images to aid in his labor. Simplifying the hero's words, it all boiled down to a seek and destroy, in which faux villain robots would be released to rampage around a mock city, and the applicants had to destroy them and score points. The robot's points varied between 1 to 3, with an additional zero pointer thrown into the mix. Present Mick explained the three robots, but left anything about the Zero Pointer, which in turn rose a few alarms inside Izuku's head. He was a hero fanboy at heart, yet Izuku knew when to become quiet and analyze the situation. Mostly. Nonetheless, if the pro hero explaining the exams was leaving something, it could mean that this exam was more than what meets the eye. The vampire nodded to himself, content in letting the idea slowly cook inside his mind, however, someone from the crowd loudly questioned the exam. The student was tall, dressed in a prim and proper uniform that definitively belonged to some sort of private school, and spoke in a somewhat condescending tone. Like that passive-aggressive tone that only the well-off could accomplish. He began complaining about the lack of explanation for the fourth faux villain, and it took the blonde hero the better part of five minutes to explain that, no, it was not a print error, and that the zero-pointer was a distraction at best. Translation. Think for yourself as to why would the number one school in heroics withhold information. It's almost like they want to test our skills to become heroes or something. No, stop it, Izuku. You are sounding like Bakugou. Being done with his explanations, present Mick sent the applicants to take their respective bus. Five minutes later and Izuku was sure that Yue somehow had an endless budge. The test application area was huge enough to be a city on its own. The teens were then directed to a nearby locker room to change into something more comfortable. The vampire quickly shed his skull gakuren to change into a beige sports short. He left his red sneakers on, and finally changed the upper part of his uniform for a white muscle shirt with the kanji for pants written across it. Yeah, yeah, laugh it up at his choice of clothing. After he changed, the vampire exited the locker room and mingled about with the other applicants. Izuku took the time to lightly stretch, warming his body for whatever Yue had in store for him. The exposed parts of his skin began to steam, Daywalker already taking care of it for the Hemimincer. As he finished his warm-up, Izuku noticed that the other applicants had given him some distance, no doubt somewhat intimidated by his appearance in this team. 
all except one. Blue hair, engine exhaust pipes coming out of his calves in tall stature. The same guy from before made his way towards Izuku, loudly calling out the green-haired vampire. Hey, you. Your disruptive behavior is improper. Are you truly aiming for heroics? Intimidating the other candidates and making use of your court before it is allowed is a serious offense, and UA could have you disclassified immediately for such improper behavior. Are you listening to him before Glasses Khan could finish calling out Izuku, the vampire grabbed a hold of the taller boy's shirt, bringing both to eye level. Blue eyes meet crimson glowing orbs, their calm emerald color all but forgotten. Izuku barely contained the anger simmering inside his heart, his hunter instincts almost begging for him to use mesmerize, and leave this impudent blood bag incapable of any action. To see the look of desperation inside those blue eyes as his body didn't obey his commands, and in the end he would realize that all his pompous behavior was not, but a foolish lamb's babbling. Deep breaths, Izuku. Blocking the inner beast with his iron will in the confines of his mind, Izuku slowly let the power dissipate from his pupils, letting the crimson glow be gone from his orbs. Releasing the taller boy's shirt, Izuku backed off slowly. His claws had tore holes where his digits had been, but it was much better than harming a fellow applicant. Before anyone could question whatever had happened, an air horn loudly blared, calling the attention of all the applicants to the suddenly open gates that led into the foe city. What, were you all expecting some sort of warning? Lesson number one, young listeners, expect the unexpected. The timer is running already, so show us what you are made of. Plus ultra, remember. Present mixed voice echo and soon, all the applicants were desperately running towards the city, various robots waiting for them on the streets. Izuku Flash stepped his way inside the center of the foe city, many other applicants following behind him. Glasses Khan was already taking out robots, his powerful kicks easily breaking the robots that stood in his path. All the others made use of their abilities and attacked the robots, Izuku being no exception to that rule. For going the slow method, Izuku used his claws to dig deep into his arms, immediately bringing out a great quantity of his blood out, and fixing it into the shape of his gauntlets, rushing to meet the first robot in his path. He sharp turned into the closest turn, meeting three one-pointers and one three-pointer. All the foe villains locked on him, but were unable to follow up with the slaughter. The vampire made constant use of flash step, quickly entering the guard of the first robot, the sharp claws of his gauntlet, easily shearing the armor plating guarding the chest area in a shower of scrap metal. The robot fell backwards, Izuku already jumping off the broken machinery and engaging the remaining ones. Bits and pieces of metal were woven with the aid of advanced hemimancy, reinforcing his blood construct and adding to the damage he could cause. He ran up to another one-pointer and jumped over the telegraph punch, using the arm of the robot as a platform to easily access the neck area. One slash and one decapitation down, the hemimancer locked his sights into the next one-pointer. His next move had been one of the many he had practiced due to hemimancy, which allowed for longer range combat. Focusing all the blood covering his right arm into a thin shape, Izuku jumped high and threw a crimson-colored javelin of blood into the eye socket of the three-pointer. Free falling for just a second, the team descended into the last one-pointer and slashed with his remaining left gauntlet, the bloody construct carving into the military green-tinted metal, and allowing Izuku to slowly lower himself into the ground, as his claws ran down the entirety of the robot's frame, leaving out three roughly carved grooves. Wasting no time, the team continued to seek out for more foe villains. Stealthily getting the drop into a two-pointer and carving its head before it had the chance to attack. Arriving into a slugfest happening between a group of five one-pointers and one team covered in a metallic sheen, Izuku made constant use of blood spear to aid the fairest looking boy, taking out two enemies before he kept going. Tanking an impact missile that was about to hit a vine-haired girl, the vampire hurled enough blood spears to make the robot look like a porcupine. Dodging a hail of rubber bullets and whisking away a pink-skinned girl together with him, Izuku Flash stepped into the two-pointer's frame and sunk his bare hand into the machine's chest, savagely ripping out the working motor and throwing it into a second two-pointer that was soon melted down by a glob of acid. Aiding a boy with strange tusks in his mouth, shouting to him when he was about to be blindsided by a one-pointer, and using blood spear to stop the robot in its tracks long enough for the boy to cut the robot in half. Izuku did not stop to hear anything that those people said, all his focus directed into controlling his blood and hunting down the villains inside the city. The number seemed to be decorous and fast, which considering the many able combatants present, it was only expected. He saw some robots float up before suddenly dropping down and crashing into a shower of metal. Not going north, that's taken. He turned west and was about to throw another blood spear, but one light beam beat the vampire to the punch. He heard some French words being used, but his focus quickly shifted to hunt other robots. Focus on the hunt, manage the amount of blood you are using. Take as many villains as you are able to with your claws. Using too much blood too fast. His quick stop to access the situation almost led into Izuku being punched by a three-pointer. Luckily, horns came from the opposite direction, and made the punch go off course long enough for Izuku to turn around and slash the throat height, severing important cables at the neck of the larger robot. 
his head turned into the direction where the horns had come from, his red eyes finding a blonde girl with two sharp horns on the side of her head. She gave him a thumbs up, which Izuku returned with a head nod. Less and less robots seemed to be appearing as the combat got more heated, and students became more desperate for points. Izuku looked at his somewhat trembling hands, the broken nails regrowing to their sharp point in a few instants. Once more he slashed at his arms, bringing out his gauntlets for another round. He was able to detect a few stragglers even under the sound of intense combat, some applicants beginning to slow down under the heat of combat. Thirteen out of the fifteen minutes were gone in all but an instant, the sounds of combat slowing down, accompanying the lack of robots. Izuku had just finished another three-pointer, making the robot shoot its impact missile against its own head, when he realized that the other teens had all stopped. He let the carcass of the robot fall and was about to close his eyes to listen for more targets, when the ground trembled. The vampire did not need to enhance his hearing, the approaching enemy was not hiding itself. Being that large, what need did the robot had for hiding? Being about the size of a 20 meters high building, the zero pointer was truly a distraction. A waste of time and something to be avoided at all costs. Not worth the remaining time of the exam. Everyone knew this and had the same idea, running away from that was the only logical step one ought to take to pass this exam. So, why was Izuku trembling in excitement? Why was his heart pumping so fast that he could feel all his blood? Why was he so full with adrenaline that standing still seemed sacrilegious and would lead to him bursting? Hunter N6 was just short of yelling at him to take action already. His pearly white fangs felt itchy, the call of the inner beast. So drunk in this sudden sensation, Izuku almost missed the distress call of a girl asking for help. He passed the other students, running out beside of them. Blood gauntlets fully strengthened, Izuku also covered his legs with bloody greaves, their shapes shifting between armor and claw-like feet, akin to those of a dragon. His body was exhaling his power to the maximum. Even with his body steaming, Izuku was still moving towards this obstacle. Blood flowed, seeping through the pores of his skin and covering his neck and mouth in a bracing mouth guard piece that resembled a mask. A shifting design as life liquid worked to obey the commands of the Hemimincer. Like a Oni Smiler Dragon's Maw. Izuku roared his challenge to the machine, rushing it like a red missile. The hand of the Zero Pointer approached, coming close to the girl buried in concrete rubble, but it was stopped by a crimson missile. The inner beast had been unleashed. Like he was teleporting around, the crimson mass of violence began slashing at any and every metal part of the Zero Pointer, scrap metal raining down at the robot's feet, as the tornado of slashing blood began ascending and making its way up the arm of the gigantic foe. Crushing and slashing, no peace was spared as Izuku raged the, attacking and destroying the foe villain. Explosions began happening around the entirety of the frame of the behemoth, claws destroying important mechanical parts, hydraulics and pistons, becoming nothing less than scrap metal. Hand, arm, shoulder joint, trapezium, neck and finally head. The zero pointer powered down, the powerful tracks unmoving as the robot slumped, shut down. One of the many headlights broken from it, a boy fell down. There were still about 5 meters before the vampire could meet the ground, but no one could move after such brutal display of power. The T managed to right himself in the air, feet down as he crashed into the ground like a bullet, and cracked the asphalt under him. The crimson armaments were not unequipped, and the glimmer of rubies was not present in the green-haired vampire's eyes. He simply stayed quiet, tiredness overcoming the teen as he laid under the shadow of his defeated foe, panting to regain his breath. Another air horn blasted loudly, announcing the end of the physical portion of the UA exams, and leaving many with a sight that would not be forgotten so soon. Izuku swore that he was going crazy with the weight. It had been almost over a week after the test in Yue, and the green-haired vampire was somewhat worried that he was not going to get an answer from the high school. Had they profiled him a danger to the other students due to his quirk? There was no way of knowing this, and that was after he combed through the web for any information he could find about it. Nothing outstanding came out of his search, his only findings were some trolls in online forums making false statements with how they had passed the exams. The vampire sighed. He was somewhat ashamed of the way he had performed in the day. All contact Izuku had to combat had been ambushes or short instances where he had overwhelmed his adversaries with hemimency. During the physical portion of the exams, he had cut loose and simply let his body guide him. How that had resulted in his new ultimate move was a shocker to the pale teen. After he destroyed the entirety of the Zero Pointer's inner structure, Izuku found that the red haze of bloodlust that overcame him also left him pretty much drained of strength for a while. Lucky him that recovery girl was running rounds as one of the staff members. She first offered to heal him using her power, but the vampire had only needed to drain one or two blood bags for him to be up and running again. It went without saying that of course he only got to drink his treat after he hid inside the nurse's office and had no one looking at him as he fed. Plenty of people were already shell-shocked after his stunt when releasing rage, there was no need for him to add to the list. The vampire tried to distract himself by fiddling with his phone, but nothing of interest caught his attention, leaving the hemimincer to ponder alone in his room. His mother was out working to cover a shift for a friend of hers, so he had the apartment all to himself. 
Not that he could do much with that, considering he was a loner. Ping. His cell phone lit up with a text. Izuku slowly extended a tendril of blood from his left wrist to grab the device, lazily looking who had sent him the message. The image of pink dreadlocks smeared with a thick layer of grease and motor oil entered his sight, making Izuku stand up from his bed and go to the kitchen for a drink. He unlocked the screen as he went to his mini fridge, eyes skimming through the random assortment of blueprints that the girl had sent him to analyze and give his opinions about. Since Mei figured out that Izuku overanalyzed other people's quirks and their effectiveness for diverse applications, the girl began a full assault upon his free time by working on diverse projects and presenting, reed shoving in his face, him the fruits of her labor. The majority of her projects were work ready even in their crudest forms, but the little grease monkey was always going the extra mile in embellishing her babies, which was the major cause for them exploding out of nowhere. Izuku skimmed through most of the projects, blood bag hanging from his lips as he slowly drained the contents. Her last batch of projects had been focused on his quirk, true ancestor, and to what limits he could push his abilities. She had been rather persistent in this, as an exception to the rule, the designs she had pushed out were all ineffective. The closest she had gotten to something that would aid him in the field were her nanomachines with a design focused on enhancing advanced hemimancy. Izuka left out the details in how he could acquire new abilities from the girl, otherwise she might began going around collecting blood from random people and try to feed it to him. His high-speed regeneration would probably take care of any sickness that would come to him, but he preferred not to have to cure himself of nasty illnesses. Doctors have already tried settling a deal with both him and his mother in an attempt to create a miracle drug capable of healing anything. It did not go well. The healing factor in his bloodstream could only be triggered when his blood was fresh or in his command. Considering that, if he lost physical contact with any of his fluids it would degenerate rapidly, the efforts were mostly wasted. Izuku sat on the couch of the living room and turned on the TV, waiting to see if Mei would send him another project or blueprint. He was about to finish his drink when the entry door was banged on rather energetically, a known voice on the other side of it. His phone also began to ring, Mei's profile picture being the caller. The vampire wondered what he would regret less. Staying quiet and hoping for the girl to leave on her own or allowing her to enter and cause up a storm. Hey hey Zuku. I hope you have finished looking over my blueprints, I already have a whole bunch of new improvements set for them, you know. I also know that you are at home thanks to this new baby I have designed based on that idea you gave me last time. My babies now have nocturnal, thermal and electromagnetic vision on them. He should really start controlling what he said around her. In the end, Izuku decided to let Mei inside his home, lest she get herself in trouble by shouting anything else Mei like. How could someone's common sense be so warped? He asked himself as he sank his fangs into another blood bag. He was getting really low on those, and another visit to the hospital was too soon. After her invasion of his home, the girl had immediately rushed inside his room, and quickly cleaned his desk of anything that could get in her way, brushing aside some important biology books he had sitting there. She sat on his chair and began working on a couple of blueprints she had on hand, dirtying them with some grease that was stuck on her arms. The vampire sighed and went to the kitchen to grab another blood bag, but found himself rather disappointed when he found his fridge empty. Somewhat frustrated, Izuku returned to his room to find Mei had opened a few of his books, and was constantly using one as reference for her current project. He glanced at the cover, Advanced Biology, and wondered if she was trying to go over her nanomatching project. As she noticed his presence, she the chair around and hotly crossed her arms over her chest, pride glowing from her frame. You can express your joy now, Izuku. You'll be allowed to be my very first client and have the special privilege of owning my very first grand work. Check out the blueprint. I corrected the build of the nanites, and tweaked them to be able to improve that salt bomb reflex stingy you mentioned that wouldn't work. See my baby now. He picked a paper from the desk and began reading the design, the girl's golden sight-shaped pupils, focusing on him to capture every detail, and her goggles were recording the expression he would make when he finally gave his approval to her project. She would so much rub it in his face her success, since he had been constantly shooting down her previous designs. Some nonsense about how they would fry anyone's nervous system due to information overload. The vampire focused on her work for 10 minutes before handing her back the page. She was about to shoot into a great tangent about the greatness of her baby, however, the vampire grabbed the book she had been using and skimmed a few pages before he began talking. First thing may, it's not a salt bomb reflex stingy. It's the sodium-potassium exchange process, which enables you to be able to function as you. Your nanites would not help the process so much as they would jumpstart it into high gear. I said it last time, you can't suddenly make the brain and the nervous system process this much information without making it heat up like an oven. Besides, natural adrenaline seems to be a much more safe alternative than having a kill switch like this inside a person's head. Sure, they would capture information 10 times faster than a normal person, but it would turn their brains into soup in 3 minutes. Izuka pointed out to her, showing numerous pages to confirm his statement, making Mei slump in the chair. Not fair, Izuku. 
You can't win every time. Besides, I'm pretty sure you can handle a little heat. The mechanic jumpsuit wearing girl complained to the vampire, pouting as he had effortlessly brushed aside her project like it was nothing. May, I know this is hard to remember, but not everyone can regenerate like I can. You can't just put the brain in overdrive like you are overclocking a computer. Izuku shot his barb, folding the paper into a cylinder, and lightly beating it over May's pink dreadlocks. Not that the action seemed to bother the girl as she began going over her papers before pulling one out and jumping from his chair. Whatever. I have the next very best thing right here with me. Let me check your body. Excuse me, what? Izuku blinked after a few seconds passed. That time was enough for May to disappear from his line of sight and get behind him. Hunter instinct screamed danger as Hatsune's arms wrapped around his torso, and her hands began running around his body. He tried to gain some distance from the girl, but she clung onto his back, hands running over his shoulders, and unknowingly pressing her plentiful assets on him. My next baby will be a full exosuit that will work as an all-terrain. Your body seems to be a good template for me to work with. It's decided, you'll be my model. Hatsume exclaimed, clinging even closer to Izuku. Nothing is decided. What the hell, Hatsume? Izuku tried to intervene, but May could be mighty stubborn once she set her mind to something. Instead of releasing him, she locked her legs around his waist, increasing their closeness. At this distance, not even if she had been dunked on motor oil mattered, as Izuku could hear the rhythmic beating of her heart. He tried once more to create some distance between the two, but May was pretty strong, considering she constantly carries piles of scrap metal, it should not have been this surprising, and her hold was solid. Trying to separate them would imply a use of stronger force, and the vampire was not willing to hurt his first girlfriend. She grinned, seeing as Izuku stopped resisting her, and once more began running her hands over his packed frame. Lean muscles that belittled the power they held, Izuku would be the perfect model for any armor or outfit project model that Mei would ever need. His knowledge and insight were insanely helpful when making babies, and he had an ever so interesting quirk. Midoriya Izuku was someone whom Hatsune could truly appreciate. Thus, she was not worried when she was suddenly slipped from his back and flung into his soft bed. Neither was she worried when he pounced upon her, agility surpassing any robot she had seen or built. Hatsune was never afraid of the vampire in front of her, no matter the situation, but she had to admit that the sight of his frame over hers was one that could intimidate people. Normal people, that is. Hatsume was not your run-of-the-mill gal. His emerald green orbs were shining like rubies, consequence of the obscure power they held, Izuku's face began approaching hers, as his eyes constantly searched for any move from her. Not that minded, she was constantly getting in people's faces too. She felt some sort of switch inside her head being tested, sudden thoughts sprouting in her head, and all of them concerning the green-haired Hemimincer atop her. They quickly turned into build ideas she put into mental footnotes. The switch stopped being searched for, as Izuku's eyes left her pupils and focused into something close to her shoulder. Maybe he had had some genius idea and needed to inspect her. She had done it earlier, so she understood his sudden urge. That was what made him such a great partner. Though, she found it weird when he opened his mouth and showed her his fangs, tongue wetting his lips, as if he had found a tasty meal. Did he have food on his bed beside her head? His tongue slowly ran over her left shoulder, a slowly numbing sensation happening where his saliva had been smeared. The strap of her sleeveless tank top had been pushed aside to better allow access to his tongue. May wondered if she could also continue her analyses of his body, so she moved her hands to reach his abdomen. Before they could touch his clothed torso, one of his hands quickly shot out and grabbed both of her hands with a firm grip. She put more strength into her push until her hands managed to touch his abs, slowly running over his frame, as he allowed her to inspect him once more. May opened a smile as she filed the ideas running over her head into what could be built now, and what needed to wait until her entry into UA, but they became jumbled together rather incoherently, when Izuku bit her left shoulder, fangs easily sinking into her flesh. Normally, she would feel pain as those fangs of his were able to pierce steel easily, but a dull and rather pleasurable sensation ran down her spine. His tongue continued lapping around the area, the numbing sensation slowly spreading. He did mention to her once how his cork required him to drink blood constantly, so she did not give it much thought. Friends helped friends, so Mei was fine with Izuku feeding a little on her, he did help her a lot, it was only fair she did help him too. Besides, some ideas were sprouting in her mind about the type of support items she could build to aid the process. Ideas that once more became a mess as Mei began feeling a heat in her lower abdomen. When had his room gotten so hot and stuffy? And why was there a rot poking her leg? She could feel that Izuku had drank some of her blood as he made a low gulping noise. He rose his head from her left shoulder, tongue lapping the tiny rivulets of blood that accumulated where her skin had been pierced. His tongue lapped until the bleeding stopped, his head turning to her right shoulder to repeat the same process with slow and methodical steps. By the time he left her right shoulder, May was panting hard, and a rather uncomfortable heat had pulled all over her, the majority of it focused on her lower abdomen, as the girl felt her skin overly sensitive and warm to the touch. 
Her mind tried focusing on her projects, spread out over on his desk just a few feet away from her, but the heat did not allow her mind to focus. Or get as close as possible of that since she admitted that she wasn't the best at focusing into a single thing. And there was this metal rod poking at her leg that seemed to be gathering more and more of her attention, even when all it was doing was it being pressed into her. She would ask Izuku if he knew what such strange heat meant, maybe he would know if she had some fever or something, but Hatsum lost her chance as he dove at her right shoulder again. This time, however, May felt Izuku's every action. From his labored breath to the slow sinking of his fangs into her soft flesh and the lapping of his rough tongue. A spring had coiled inside her before she knew it, and when the vampire finished his last drink, never gulping more than a few milliliters, the spring snapped, and Hatsum found herself releasing a sweet moan, as the heat that had built up for so long finally paid off. Her normally perfect vision blurred and to her surprise, even a few tears pulled over her eyes as she released steamy breaths. I Aizu, W wa. Her voice sounded more mellow than she had ever heard, May not even managing to complete her question as she continued panting. It was like this that Izuku found himself waking up to, the red haze over his eyes gone as he felt crimson nectar flowing down his throat and warming his body, giving him a few memories of a builder and many tools. It also went without saying that he was beyond embarrassed by the sight of Hatsum under him, her eyes out of focus and a massive blush painting her face. Which was wrong to the power of four. May did not blush. He almost flashed step heat away from the girl and bolted to the closest window, opening it to allow fresh air inside his room. His nose was picking up a musky scent coming from his own body, but also an intoxicatingly sweet smell coming from the mechanic girl. It took Izuku the better part of 20 minutes before he calmed down and had soon to become talkative again, instead of the mostly panting mess that she was a few minutes before. He gave her the excuse of going for some refreshments and bolted to the kitchen. She seemed to not mind his fleeting excuse, which she was going to take as a blessing. After a few minutes to get his emotions and urges in check, Izuku decided to head back to his room. Before he left the kitchen, the vampire noted a letter on the ground close to the entry door of the apartment. Had his answer from Yue finally arrived. He rushed to get the letter, carefully picking the envelope and immediately rushing to his room. He opened the door, forgetting that Hatsum was still inside his room. The vampire closed the door and sat on his chair, staring at the letter as if waiting for the contents to magically expose themselves. Izuku did stare at the letter for five minutes before Mei's hand grabbed his shoulder. You do know that letters don't open themselves, don't you Izuku? Come on, open it already. I'm pretty sure you passed, so let's just get the official green card already. Come on, open up. Mei shook him by his shoulders, making the vampire nod and agree with her. Using his pointer finger claw-like nail, Izuku cut the top part of the envelope open, from which a letter and a metallic disc fell out. The vampire followed the disc, his eyes never letting a single movement from it flee from his sight, his earlier shameful moment with Mei all but forgotten for now. The disc finally stopped in place, allowing the vampire to release a sigh he did not now he was holding. The disc lit up, revealing a projection of a rather famous American-themed hero. I am here, as a projection. The booming voice of Al Might almost made Izuku feel as if the hero was inside his room. Mei squealed in joy, not at the hero, but towards the disc. I must say, young Midoriya, your results were absolutely stunning. From your almost perfect score on the written exam, a place was surely guaranteed to you in the general studies course, yet you went beyond that. The very definition of plus ultra. Behind the hero, a screen lit up and started playing bits from his physical exam. The short videos displayed his aggressive combat, how he had destroyed many of the robots in a manner not unlike a savage beast. All the moments made Mate become a machine gun, spitting out ideas for projects like a maniac. There was semantic where Almite was scolded by someone in the back for taking too long in this letter. As I was saying, Young Midoriya, not many are capable of displaying the abilities or the nature you have, a hero who protects all and helps those in need, regardless of their situation. Even when you were many points ahead of the competition and had absolutely no need to help your competitors, you still did it anyway. But your score of 65 villain points, plus the 8 perfect tens awarded in rescue points from our judging staff, your entrance score hits 145 points. Come, young Midoriya, continue displaying your abilities here at your Hero Academia. Go ahead and go beyond, plus ultra. Let it be known that when Inko got home, that the woman almost flooded the apartment as the video of the disc continued replaying for various hours, until the battery ran out. Izuku was paralyzed, not moving one inch from his chair, as Mei continued fixing her building projects at his side. There was also the fact that she was sitting in the vampire's lap, but that's a tale for another day. The teen checked his backpack once more, his mother's orders, and confirmed that all his items were indeed safely inside it. He checked himself in front of the mirror, Yue's uniform fitting him nicely. Neither too large, nor too tight was how he had requested the grey coloured suit. The undershirt he was wearing had a hoodie that he would use if the sun was too strong outside. No need to tire himself and abuse Daywalker. He still needed to drop by the hospital to get more blood bags after all. 
Finally ready, Izuku left his apartment and headed to the train station that would take him to Yue. The train ride was quiet, the vampire not feeling any thirst, even when surrounded by people in his ride. He was still feeling guilty after his debacle with Mei, but the mechanic girl had not been stressed over the situation. In fact, she had offered him more blood and even convinced him of having a pack at her neck if he was feeling thirsty. How she had managed to get him to agree with her was a mystery up to know, but his shock upon receiving the UA letter probably had something to do with it. Twenty minutes and two stops later, Izuku was in front of the prestigious UA Academy school grounds. Many unknown faces, just as many quirks for him to discover and document up. His mouth watered a bit as his eyes focused on some of the more colorful students he could see. Yeah, he was still adapting to having improved sight, but thankfully he could only see a bit farther and with more precision. Nothing like the absurd 5 kilometers that Mei could push her vision to, but it was an improvement nonetheless. Izuku breathed deeply, taking in fresh air and making his way towards his classroom. He still had time to spare, having decided to come earlier and avoid any tension. The new year was an opportunity to finally make new friends, but Izuku hoped to take it easy. He found the door to his classroom and took in the detail that the sliding door was way too big. Sliding it open and entering, the teen found that some people were already inside the class. A boy with dual-colored hair and a face scar, a rather developed girl with her hair in a ponytail, and a smaller girl with two jacks protruding from her earlobes. All were scattered in various seats, but their eyes settled upon the new entry in the room. Izuku nodded to them and rose his hand in a silent greeting, also receiving silent acknowledgement from his classmates. So far so good, he hadn't scared them off with his appearance. He did his best to avoid showing off his claw-like nails or his fangs, opting for a seat in the middle of the class. Not too close, neither too far from the other students. Just like the books he read for self-help, maintaining a respectful distance was essential in making good impressions. He placed his things in his desk and quietly sat down, waiting for the others to come about. His ears easily picked conversation between the two girls in class, but he opted to dull his senses and avoid spying on them. The other boy inside the room seemed to be well in his own, so Izuku decided to just wait for the other rivals. Four were already inside the class, 16 other teens to come. As time passed, the class slowly filled up. From a blonde guy with a black bolt streaking his hair to a taller fellow with bulky elbows, a pink-skinned girl chatting up with a redeed with sharp teeth. Frog looked like girls slowly walking to class, a raven-headed teen and another guy with a tail. Class 1 was full with many different figures. Small pockets of conversation were spreading here and there, but all conversation settled when one figure entered the room. Ash blonde hair and as pleasant as ghost pepper candy, Bakugu threw open the sliding door and walked to his chosen desk, as if he owned the class. His usual scowl in place, Katsuki almost growled when he saw the green hair and the pale expression of Izuku. The two stared at each other for a while, but Bakugu decided to sit down with only a click of his tongue. A fact that Izuku took as a blessing, if only because the blonde sat two chairs away from him. When a tall fellow with glasses entered the class as stiff as a robot, Izuku almost released a groan. Glasses con from the exam, just my luck. The vampire picked the stiff steps from the blue-haired teen coming close to him, but he sighed in relief when the boy stopped in front of Bakugu's desk. Hey there. Such disrespectful behavior shall not be tolerated inside this classroom. Your rudeness might give the wrong image about our class to our sensei, and as a fellow classmate, it is my duty to request that you take your feet from your desk, and properly sit on your chair. Glasses Khan requested of Bakugu, which made the bomber release a loud sneer from his mouth. Izuku zoomed it out, focusing in his open notebook. He began selecting pages and taking guesses at the quirks of those present in the class, first focusing on those that hate the easier physical alterations. The girl with the frog features, the teen with the raven head, the smaller boy with purple hair, blonde boy with the lightning bolt on hair, jack ears girl, the teen with six arms, pink skin girl. All of them were quickly sketched in his pages as Izuku tried to pick apart and settle back the puzzle that was guessing their quirks. His focus was only broken when he noticed footsteps coming his way. He rose his head to see who was coming towards him, eyes quickly settling upon the bubbly girl with brown hair. Her face bloomed a smile as she recognized him. He did not know this girl, but she seemed happy to be seeing him here. Hey there, Freckles Kun. Izuku found the sudden nickname strange. Yes, he did have freckles in his face, why was it the thing she had settled his image about? Not his pale expressions or his fangs, but his freckles. Man, that thing you did with that big robot was amazing. The way you went Baba Baba and them swoosh, that was really cool. The girl did try to express herself, but the sounds made it hard to guess, were it not for the fact that he knew what she meant. How he had raged D and let loose on the zero pointer. Many of his fellow classmates perked up at what she was saying, many whispers about the zero pointer, and a red blur being the most prominent. The bubbly girl would continue talking, but another two sounds caught the attention of the vampire. The quick shuffling of feet, as glasses Khan rushed to Izuku's chair, and the sound of something dragging on the ground close to the classroom's door. 
The door opened silently, and the vampire finally had something with which to pin the sound of cloth dragging on. A yellow sleeping bag that resembled a giant caterpillar, from which an unshaven and unkept face popped out. Izuku's eyes almost shone like rubies, a racer had been easily recognizable for him. The man felt the eyes of the young teen on his frame, and stared right back at the emerald green pupils which slightly glimmered with barely hidden crimson light. For about 8 seconds, a racer had, or is always shouta, waited at the door of the classroom for the students, apart from the green-headed one, to notice his presence. If you all are done wasting time, your homeroom teacher had arrived. Lifting himself from the ground and shedding his cozy sleeping bag, Azawa made his displeasure at the antics happening inside one and own. He fished for something inside his bag, taking out both a supplement pack and a PE uniform. After he threw the uniform to the closest person, bubbly girl being struck on her face by the uniform, the hero quickly sucked his supplement pack dry. I expect you in the PE grounds in 5, we are having a quirk apprehension test. No more explanations were given by the pro hero, seeing as he quickly vanished from sight and left the students with one thing in their minds. What the hell was that? 